The Date Next Door, Do-Over Date Series, Book 3 By Susan Hatler Chapter 1 The only thing worse than unpacking is unpacking twice, yet I'm currently unpacking for the third time since moving to downtown Sacramento. Yay, me. Not. In my book, unpacking ranks right up there with scrubbing the pot after making mac and cheese, picking gum off the sole of my favorite sneakers, or trying to find a room to rent from roommates I don't know. So, I'd chosen queen of couch hopping, until today. Before bouncing from couch to couch in my friend's downtown pads, I'd been living with two of my four brothers outside of the city and had grown tired of commuting to my job. Rush hour traffic twice a day? Pass. After bumming it on my friend Krista's couch and then on my friend Abigail's couch, I was now officially renting a room from my childhood best friend Lucy Remington. Lucy and I had always talked about rooming together in college, but then she had gone off to Princeton whereas I'd attended college locally at UC Davis. After all these years, Lucy and I were finally living together. I would have been jumping up and down if I weren't, you know, unpacking. I surveyed my new room in her swanky townhome, the tall ceiling, the white-trimmed windows with Roman shades, and my twin mattress, box springs, and frame I'd used since college. My gaze landed on Lucy as she lifted one of my sundresses to her chest and then scrutinized her reflection in the room's full-length mirror. I just dug that dress out of one of the many cardboard boxes I'd lugged up the staircase of Lucy's new townhome, which her mom had bought her, paid cash, mind you, just so Lucy would live close to her parents. Must be nice. The last thing my mom bought me was a box of candy at the movie theater when we saw the latest Jennifer Lawrence movie. But, in my mom's defense, my parents weren't exactly loaded like the Remingtons. Lucy had a credit card from her parents with no limit and shopped at designer boutiques, whereas I usually bought my clothes from sale racks and secondhand stores. Despite our financial polarities, we bonded as kids. My shoulders tensed as I hung a denim jacket on a hanger and then set it on the rack inside the closet. Unpacking, endless unpacking. Next, I grabbed a pair of jeans, folded it into a dresser drawer, and then turned around to find the sundress my friend had been holding tossed back into the box I'd just emptied. Lucy! I picked up the dress as she turned to face me, her hand hovering over the jacket I'd just hung up. She snatched her hand back and put on an innocent look. Her eyes widened. What's up, Hannah? You're missing the whole unpacking part of this process, I said, tilting my head to the left, my dark curls bouncing on my shoulder. You offered to help, not work against me. I'm just so excited that we're finally roommates. Lucy grinned and then took the dress and put it on a hanger as I returned to another seemingly bottomless box. Sharing clothes is practically required for roommates. I'm just checking out my options. Oh, is that what you're doing? I laughed as she dug deeper into my nearly bursting closet. Lucy's closet was filled with Prada and Gucci, whereas mine held thrift store finds and bargain buys. Mashed together or combined clothing outfits would definitely be one of a kind. But none of these plain black skirts or button-ups are going to work for my date tonight, Lucy grumbled, tossing a couple of rejected outfit choices over her shoulder and back into a cardboard box. This is my last try for a boyfriend I can actually count on before I give up for good, so my outfit has to reflect that goal or I'm toast. No pressure or anything, I said, raising an eyebrow. Right? Well, if Derek were making me dinner at home then one of those outfits might have worked, but he's taking me to the boathouse for dinner. You know, that restaurant on the river in Old Sack? I nodded, feeling slightly envious. Must be nice to have a date you're looking forward to. You dated Patrick for a little while there, she said, giving me a look that told me she hadn't loved Patrick and didn't exactly miss him. Patrick was nice, I said, shrugging my shoulders. Just a little too, flaky for me. I'm done with flaky, too. She nodded, grabbing a handful of the new office clothes I'd bought after my recent promotion. 
so not dating attire either. They're my new work clothes, okay? I said, tidying up Lucy's mess. I'd actually been tidying Lucy's messes since the first day of grade school when she accidentally dropped her cafeteria tray in the lunchroom and cried. I'd cleaned up her mess, shared my apple slices with her, and we've been besties ever since. I stared at my new outfits for the office and sighed. I've had a lot of pressure at work ever since my boss quit and started her own luggage business. Jennifer, right? I thought she promoted you before she left. She did, but now I have to live up to the pay raise by impressing a client my new boss wants me to sign. Your new boss is still writing you, huh? To say the least, I said, studying the pinstriped pencil skirt she held up, which was a departure from my normally free-spirited style. If I don't sign this client then I really think my boss is going to fire me. I wasn't his pick for the job and Jennifer had a hard time convincing him to give me the chance. I've got one shot, so I can't mess it up. I'd been working at the prestigious marketing firm of Haskell and Haskell for two years now and had recently been promoted to the head of their newly created social media department. Despite my experience at the company, Peter Haskell, the CEO, didn't love that I'd received my Bachelor of Arts in Sociology. He was all about looking good on paper and apparently my resume didn't fit the bill. I wasn't his first, or second, choice for the position, so he was scrutinizing my every move at the office. Luckily, Jennifer had convinced Mr. Haskell to let me head the social media department, a must in today's marketing world. But I had to prove myself and prove myself fast. My test? Signing Ray Livingston, the self-made millionaire fashion designer, to Haskell and Haskell. The problem? Every other firm in town wanted his account. The stress levels? Hi. How would I, Hannah Griffin, in her bargain bin skirt and thrift store heels, impress multimillionaire Ray Livingston? Yeah, that's what I was still trying to figure out. But I thought starting with straight-laced, read, boring, work attire couldn't hurt. Lucy put a hand on my shoulder, making me jump. Don't worry, Han. You're going to sign this client and then your boss will realize Jennifer was right about promoting you. Thanks for your faith, but I don't know, my stomach roiled. I felt an over my head. Every second spent unpacking was a second I could be strategizing on how to land this new client. Yet I didn't seem to be making progress on the unpacking front, thanks to my date-focused BFF. I gazed around at the mess in my room and panicked. I'm so going to get fired. No, you've got this. She gave my shoulder a little squeeze. I know you do. I'm not so sure, I said, wishing for the first time that I'd majored in marketing just so Mr. Haskell would be happier with me. In actuality, I'd chosen to study sociology because I seemed to do well in those classes and I'd enjoyed them. I graduated, got a job, and three years later still hadn't found my passion until I landed the job working as Jennifer's assistant and slowly realized what I wanted to do full-time, social media marketing. This was my chance. I really thought I was good at it and believed I could help Ray Livingston improve the visibility of his brand through social media. I had some great ideas. The problem was that I was a broke 26-year-old whose resume read, sociology, waitress, and assistant. Who would listen to my suggestions? Not Peter Haskell, that much was clear. This client is going to love you, Lucy insisted, staring into my eyes and nodding like she was certain. You're totally going to sign him. But how? I asked picking up my new black heels and showing her a scratch on them I hadn't noticed before. It felt unfair that not coming from a wealthy family left me at a disadvantage. Ray Livingston won't take me seriously if he thinks I don't look properly professional, which I admit doesn't matter right now anyway because I can't even get him to answer my calls or phone me back. This guy is a multimillionaire, Lucy. I need Christian Louboutin heels to make a good impression, not secondhand heels. 
Who cares what kind of shoes you're wearing, she asked, waving a hand in the air. Easy for her to say when her closet held all of the most expensive labels. I have to make the right first impression when I meet him. I grabbed the pencil skirt again, laid it on my bed and tried to smooth it out. That's why I bought this, but it seems to have permanent wrinkles. How is he supposed to take me seriously if I'm pitching to him in a wrinkled skirt? You're not pitching right this instant, Han. In my mind I was, though. Every day I mulled over a dozen scenarios of how to win this client and the pressure of succeeding and keeping my job was driving me over the edge. I looked around at the mess before me and then started pulling at the dark curls on either side of my head until my scalp hurt. This was what unpacking did to me. I mean, I don't even know how to eat caviar, I said, throwing my arms out as I veered into full freak-out mode. I'm in over my head, Lucy. I want to keep this job so badly, but my parents are middle school teachers. They never taught me how to eat caviar. How do you even eat caviar? And why? All of those little round eggs just look so. Look, Hannah! Lucy squealed, interrupting my rant. I whirled around and stared at my friend. Instead of paying attention to my obvious hysteria, as a BFF should be, she was holding up two dresses from the back of my closet. A huge smile spread across her face, which was pressed between a dress with sequins and a dress with a black tulle skirt. I groaned. Our prom dresses. How did you end up with these? she asked. I think I promised to take them to the dry cleaners. I grimaced, giving her a toothy smile. Like eight years ago. Oops. Lucy sniffed the underarm section of each dress and then shrugged. They're doable. We have to try these on. We just have to. I shook my head. Why do I have the feeling you're not hearing a thing I'm saying about my job and the crisis before me? She began dancing around the room. Don't you remember prom, Hannah? Yes, I said, remembering the letdown from that night that I never wanted to relive, which involved Lucy's older brother who I'd had a crush on forever, especially after he'd offered to take me to prom. Then, heartbreak. I'd rather unpack than relive that night. Don't you remember that I have to finish unpacking? How is that more important than prom? I need to strategize about how to sign that client, remember? So I can keep my job? Ring any bells? I strode over to her, pulled the tool mid thy A line from her hands, and then gestured at her. So I can pay you rent, so you can borrow my clothes, so you can make a mess of my room again and again. She stared in horror as I tossed the prom dress on the bed. Hannah, you don't understand. It is imperative that we try on these dresses. Right now. I sighed, knowing that when she obsessed on something there was no talking her out of it. Plus, it wasn't her fault she remembered prom night differently than I did. It's not like I'd told her about all of the times I'd fantasized about her brother, or anything. That would have been way too embarrassing. So, she had no idea how his rejection had crushed my heart. I crossed my arms. Why is it imperative that we squeeze into our old prom dresses tonight? If it's even possible to squeeze into them anymore. Let's face it, chocolate fudge ice cream is my friend. Exactly. Ice cream is all you, girl. She tapped a finger to her temple and then gestured at me. You, my sweet friend, are worrying about this client for one reason only. You've forgotten that you are Hannah Griffin and that is what matters with landing this client. That I'm Hannah Griffin? Yes, silly. Not what you wear to the office or how, or if, you eat caviar. Trying on this prom dress will help you remember who you are and that will make you feel secure again. You really think trying on the prom dresses will help my career? I asked, considering this and chewing at my bottom lip. 
I truthfully had felt more secure before taking this promotion. The pressure from the CEO had me questioning everything about myself lately. That's right. And it'll also be so much fun, she added, raising her fists in the air. I finally grinned. Okay, then. Ten minutes later, which felt more like an eternity of sucking in and yanking at zippers, Lucy and I stood side by side in our prom dresses, staring into the full-length mirror. Hot pink sneakers to go with my strapless black and silver corset bodice dress complete with the poofy tulle skirt for me, and a T-length teal sequin dress for Lucy. We looked straight out of a high school yearbook. Wow, I said, swishing my skirt back and forth. I always loved this dress. Yes, wow, Lucy echoed. Should I go meet my client right now? I laughed. She tapped her chin. Hmm, not yet. You're missing something, she paused and a mischievous glint flashed in her eyes. It's makeup time. Lucy, I seriously do have to unpack. I groaned, looking into the pouty face she made. I can't pull all-nighters like in college. I need my beauty sleep. Just a little sparkle, she pleaded, squeezing her hands together in front of her chest. A teeny tiny bit of sparkle, Han? That's all I'm asking. I knew she was procrastinating getting ready for her date, neither of us had been lucky in love recently. It was so tempting to procrastinate with her. Lucy, I whined, bouncing on my heels. Pretty please? she asked, knowing full well I never could say no to her. I mean, how was I supposed to turn down playing with makeup so I could unpack endless boxes? Makeup was pretty and colorful and fun. Boxes were brown and, well, not so much. I stretched my pinky toward Lucy. Just a little sparkle. She locked her pinky with mine. Deal. Okay, then, I relented, for the second time tonight. She squealed and darted out of my room, returning a minute later with an armful of makeup. I crossed my arms. You call that a little sparkle? Oh, indulge me. She unloaded her stash of makeup across my desk, which had taken me two hours to clean and organize. My desk was where my work computer should be, not blue eye shadow and a scattering of lip glosses. Besides, this is what I call half of a little sparkle. She ran out of the bedroom again before I could stop her and returned with more makeup. Fifteen minutes later, we were laughing so hard we could barely breathe. As I sat at my desk, I watched Lucy step over a box and admire herself in the full-length mirror. I'd done her makeup the way I had the night of our prom eyeliner too thick, bronzer too brown, lip gloss too pink, and a stick-on rhinestone star on her cheek that looked like way too much. Are you going to take that off before your date? I asked, holding my stomach, which hurt from laughing so hard. She turned to me with a frown. Of course not. I snickered and pushed back my chair. It bumped into a neglected stack of boxes I had yet to unpack. Oops. Time to get back to the task at hand. Sigh. Where do you think you're going? She asked, grabbing the leg of my chair and dragging me right back. To finish unpacking. She shook her head. Not without your makeup done and a rhinestone heart, you aren't. I threw my hands up and laughed. Why do I need to wear a rhinestone to unpack boxes? I'm not going to dignify such a silly question with a response, Hannah Rose Griffin, she grumbled, holding my chin in place as she pasted a rhinestone to my cheekbone. I thought you had a date soon, I said, trying to eye myself in the mirror but she held my chin still. I do. She smiled, staring down at two bright blue eye shadow choices. Of course she picked the brighter of the two. That was Lucy. Close your eyes, she said, before dipping a brush into the blue eye shadow. Remember back in high school how you almost had to go to prom with Blake? Yuck. Yes, I remember. 
I closed my eyes as instructed, thinking about how I'd crushed on Lucy's older brother the entire time we were growing up. Blake had teased us non-stop and I'd loved every minute of it. He'd teased us for playing with dolls while he read what he claimed was serious literature like The Hardy Boys and Goosebumps. When we were all in high school, Blake had also teased us for spending our afternoons wandering the mall while he interned at his father's law firm. Even as adults, using the term loosely since we were wearing prom dresses at 26, Blake had teased us for dominating our conversations with reality show gossip while he read the latest business magazines. Well, it had actually been about five years since I'd last seen him. But, still. Even with the prom rejection, my pulse had still raced when he'd been near me. Thank goodness he'd gone off to law school in Boston and had gotten a job there or I'd still be crushing on him. How terrible would that have been to actually go to prom with my brother? Lucy asked, shaking her head. Better than going alone, true, because at least you would have had someone to dance with. Although, he probably would have made you waltz to Britney Spears. Such a geek. He's not that bad, I said, as she swiped more blue than necessary across my eyelid, which brought me back to when she'd done the same makeup job on prom night. My high school boyfriend, Tommy Miller, had been the captain of the lacrosse team, the most popular guy in our class, super cute and funny. He was the envy of every guy and I was the envy of every girl because he was dating me. But even having an enviable high school boyfriend didn't matter to me at the time, my heart had secretly fallen for Blake. During the slow dance songs, Blake would have put you to sleep explaining why the Paris decorations weren't historically accurate to the time period, Lucy said, laughing. Open. I opened my eyes. Wow, that's a lot of blue. Close them, she said, brushing my eyelids some more. Blake would have insisted you not drink the punch, warning you of the dangers of too much high fructose corn syrup. That's an exaggeration, I said, although not too much of one. He had totally been into nutrition and health, always researching anything and everything like the bookworm he was. Seriously, Hannah, you were saved by what happened. Lucy pressed one more star-shaped rhinestone at the corner of my eye, the way she had for prom night. Um, Lucy? I said, my voice shaking a little at what I was about to admit. When Tommy hadn't made dinner reservations like he'd promised, because dude, dude, lacrosse practice I'd broken up with him and decided to go to prom alone. But Lucy insisted that would not be as much fun as having a date and she told me that Blake, who was in his sophomore year at Stanford by then, had heard about my predicament from Lucy and offered to come home for the weekend to take me to prom. My heart had swooned and my dreams had come true. But then, disaster. What's up, Han? Lucy asked, bringing me back to the present. You and I are best friends, right? Of course, she said, pinning up a curly lock of my dark hair. I bit my lip, feeling guilty over what I'd never told her. And we shouldn't have any secrets between us, right? None. I breathed in deeply. Okay, then. I'm going to tell you something I've never told you before. Her focus was on adjusting my hair in the mirror as she muttered, All right. So, I sort of, kind of. Yeah. I sighed. Had a crush on Blake back in high school. Lucy suddenly yanked the lock of hair she'd been pinning, making me yelp. I rubbed at my scalp and grumbled at my friend's reflection in the mirror. I guess the truth does hurt. She put a hand to her mouth. I'm sorry. Super sorry. But did you seriously just say that you had a crush on my brother? I sighed. A big one. Why in the world would you have a crush on him? I don't know. I had a simple answer, but it sparked all kinds of complicated feelings. My crush had culminated after the way he'd looked at me the night of our prom. I'd come to the top of the stairs, feeling nervous and excited in my dress. Blake had been standing at the bottom of the stairs, waiting for me. 
I thought it was so sweet of him to offer to take me to my prom. He wore a tuxedo and looked more handsome than I thought was possible. As I came down the stairs, our eyes locked and something about the way he looked up at me in that moment had melted my heart completely. Then he reached for me, took my hand, and I was completely lost in him. Simple explanation about how my crush had cemented inside me. But then the next moment Tommy knocked on my door, begging forgiveness, and insisting that he'd cooked me a meal all on his own to make up for not making a dinner reservation. He grabbed my hands like they were a lacrosse stick and pleaded that I go to prom with him. At the same moment I opened my mouth to say no and tell him I would be going to prom with Blake, Blake had interrupted and said, you should go with Tommy, Hannah. What? I'd asked, my stomach dropping. I'd stared at him and found that the look that had mesmerized me earlier was gone from his eyes. Prom is for high school kids anyway, he said, shrugging and stepping back. And I'm not a kid. My mouth dropped open. Blake. Please, Hannah, Tommy said, dropping to his knees. Please, dude. I glanced over at Blake, but he was backing away. Um, yeah, I said, feeling dizzy and confused. Okay, I guess I'll go with you. Did you, um, did you bring a corsage or? Man, dude, Tommy said, smacking his forehead. I've been cooking all day and I forgot. Blake stepped forward with a corsage in his palm. It was the most beautiful corsage I'd ever seen with baby white roses and it made tears well in my eyes. Bro, you're a lifesaver. Tommy leaped to his feet and snatched the corsage from Blake. I kept my gaze on Blake as Tommy pinned the corsage to my dress until he poked me. I yelped, turned to him and warned him to be more careful. When I looked up Blake was gone. So that was how my prom had been ruined. I'd been so excited to go to that once-in-a-lifetime dance with Blake, but he'd only seen me as a high school kid. The way I thought he'd looked at me as I descended the stairs must have been my imagination. To him, I was just his little sister's friend he was doing a favor for and that was all. I remembered crying myself to sleep that night. It didn't help that Tommy's meal he had slaved over all day was a mixture of mac and cheese and hot dogs. Tommy also hadn't wanted to actually dance at prom. As I'd touched the corsage, stroked its delicate petals as I watched others on the dance floor, I'd pictured Blake dancing with me. Obviously, a total fantasy. It doesn't matter, I finally said, dismissing Lucy's wide-eyed stare with a wave of my hand. It was a silly crush. I just remembered it because we dressed up in our prom dresses, so I thought it would be funny to tell you. Lucy's laugh sounded strained. You're right, Hannah, she said, shaking her head. Because you having a crush on Blake, on my brother Blake, is definitely laugh-worthy. Totally over it now. I stared at myself in the mirror, standing there in my prom dress and pictured my 18-year-old self, who had crushed on Blake. It was a truth I'd kept hidden away in my heart, so I was glad to have finally told Lucy even though her reaction was much as I'd expected it would be. I mean, at least she hadn't passed out. Yeah, I'm totally over it, I repeated, more to convince myself than to convince her. You're totally over what, a familiar low masculine voice asked, sending chills vibrating up my arms. I whipped around and the motion yanked my hair since Lucy's comb was still in there. Ouch. I brought a hand to my throbbing scalp as I blinked, unable to believe what I was seeing. Or, rather, who I was seeing standing in the doorway to my room, Blake Remington, after all these years. Blake wasn't the same floppy-haired nerdy boy from the bottom of the stairs all of those years ago, either. His short, light brown hair was combed back and styled, with a few strands falling across his forehead. He stood straighter and maybe even taller than the college kid who had held onto the banister as he looked up at me at the top of the stairs. His shoulders were wider and the muscles along his once-skinny arms were now well-defined even through his crisp white button-down. 
He leaned against the doorframe to my bedroom, holding a suit jacket draped over his shoulder, wearing a look of confidence I hadn't seen in the days when he used to lock himself inside his father's study to read all afternoon. I was almost convinced this man, emphasis on the word man, was an entirely different person. But then our eyes met and held. A zing zapped my belly, making me gulp. Blake might have grown up since the last time I saw him over five years ago, but the espresso brown eyes that were always full of quiet, steady kindness, hadn't changed. And neither had the way those eyes made me feel when he looked at me. Suddenly, it felt as if I were at the top of those stairs and my feelings for Blake washed over me again like I was 18. He smiled at me, making me feel that it didn't matter what I was wearing or where I bought my clothes or whether or not I knew how to eat caviar. I was just myself and those brown eyes seemed to tell me I was perfect that way. Little Hannah Griffin, Blake said, grinning. I can't believe it. Before I could utter a single word, he stepped over my still unpacked boxes, wrapped his arms around me and pulled me into a hug. My heart rate picked up as I breathed in his spicy cologne. And felt his rock-solid chest and firm biceps. Oh, wow. Um, hey, Blake. What are you doing here? I managed to ask as he pulled back, still smiling at me, before giving his sister a quick hug as well. Nice to see you, too, Griffin, he said, chuckling. My cheeks heated. No, I meant. No offense taken. He patted my arm with his palm that seemed way bigger than it had five years ago. Sorry to interrupt. Just came over to take some measurements, he said. My eyebrows rose. Measurements? Yeah, of the couches and whatnot, so I know how to decorate my place. I tilted my head. Your place? Blake looked from me to Lucy and then turned back to me again. Lucy didn't tell you, he asked, the corner of his mouth curving upward. I tucked my chin. Tell me what? Oopsies. Lucy smiled sheepishly when I glanced at her before returning my attention to Blake. Guess I forgot. Forgot what exactly? I asked. Our parents want us to live close to them, so they bought this townhouse for Lucy, he said, tapping his toe against my bedroom floor, before he gestured toward the open doorway. And since I just started working at my dad's law firm here in downtown Sac, they bought the identical townhome next door for me. I blinked rapidly as his words sank in. You're. I'm, we're. Neighbors, Blake finished my sentence for me. You're living next door, I said, my body going numb. It's common knowledge that the best cure for a crush is distance, lots and lots of distance. You like a boy and he lives here in Sac? Move to Alabama. You think your coworker is cute? Quit your job. You can't stop thinking about your best friend's older brother? Avoid seeing him for five years and keep away from social media. I had been doing fine. I barely even thought about Blake most days. Okay, barely was a bit of a stretch, but still. In my mind, he'd been the same gangly, book nerd who had teased us as kids. Now he was this suave, smooth lawyer man, who was now my next-door neighbor. That is quite the opposite of distance. Not okay. So not okay. Isn't that great news? Blake asked, wrapping one arm around Lucy's shoulder and the other arm around mine. Just like old times. I looked up at him and forced an unsteady smile. Yay. He squeezed me against his toned body and I pumped a half-hearted fist to my chest, knowing I didn't stand a chance of ignoring my crush with him living next door to me. I glanced down at my outdated prom dress and shoes. Oh, yeah, I just loved unpacking. Chapter 2 Oh, no! Lucy stood in my room next to her brother, glanced down at her cell phone and smacked her palm against her forehead. I'm late for my date. I have to go. 
You're not wearing that to dinner, are you? I asked, staring at the teal sequins along her skirt as she slipped free from under Blake's arm. Why not? she asked, shrugging. Because you're wearing a prom dress, I said, noting with every cell in my body that Blake's arm was still around me from his initial greeting. Oh, well. Lucy shrugged and pinched my cheeks before walking off. Have fun catching up, you too, she called from the top of the stairs. A few seconds later, I heard the front door slam shut. She's actually going on a date in that prom dress, I said, marveling at the thought of the guy's expression when he took his first look at her. Then I realized I was now alone with Blake and wearing my prom dress. I glanced up to check out the look on his face. His brown eyes peered down at me, making my belly do a little flip. So, how have you been all these years, Griffin? I breathed in the scent of his spicy cologne again, which made me feel dizzy. Or maybe that was because his arm was around me. Did he realize he was still holding me in a side hug? Or had he forgotten? Because every inch of me realized it and I was starting to feel faint. Um, yeah, I've been good, I answered, stepping away from him and putting some much-needed distance between us. I'm working at Haskell and Haskell downtown. Doing the grown-up thing, I said, wanting to shake my head at how lame that sounded. Haskell and Haskell, he said, letting out a whistle. Well, look at you. What about you? I asked, busying myself with folding a blanket until I realized that it was already folded. Oh. How. Embarrassing. Blake leaned back against the wall, crossing one foot over the other. Passed the bar last year. Worked at a law office on the East Coast for a few years. Now I'm practicing at the old man's firm, he said, keeping his gaze on mine as the corner of his mouth lifted. You sure have grown up. You, too, I said, watching his eyes, which seemed to be assessing me further. What was he looking at for so long? I glanced down at my strapless corset bodice, black tulle skirt and hot pink sneakers. My face suddenly heated. How had I forgotten I was wearing my prom dress? Blake must think I looked like a child playing dress up next to him in his perfectly tailored blue suit, crisp white button down, and polished brown shoes. I mean, he looked like a magazine ad whereas I looked like a young Cinderella at Disneyland. My curls probably looked flammable piled high on top of my head with an ozone-penetrating amount of hairspray. Oh, and let's not forget the blue eye shadow that Lucy went haywire over. If I were worried that Blake had viewed me as a child in the past, then I should definitely be worried more now. It was nice catching up, but I was just about to get back to unpacking, I said, trying in vain to smooth down the giant poof of curls Lucy had pinned up in my hair. I pointed toward the boxes to prove my point. Why was I being so awkward? Maybe it was the rhinestones. I tried to peel them off my face as Blake chuckled. I'm not even going to ask what you two have been up to, he said, grinning. So, yeah, I said, giving up on the rhinestones. What kind of glue had Lucy added anyway? I shook my head. My cheeks were warming and surely reddening. I hid them from Blake by reaching into a half-empty box. I'd better get back to unpacking, or I'll never be done. Sorry, I'm on a bit of a time crunch and need to finish as soon as possible. I'll help you then, he said, stepping toward me. Oh, no! I whirled around with my palms up and accidentally placed my hands on Blake's chest. Had he always had such strong packs? I pulled my hands back after I realized I was touching him. It's really all right, I insisted, forcing an awkward laugh. I'm sure you have better things to do than help me out. I don't know, he said, chuckling again. It's not every day that I get to hang clothes with the prom queen. Fully blushing now, I remembered Tommy dipping me low on stage in the explosion of confetti and planting a wet smooch on my lips as the crowd of students cheered. 
I remembered the moment that would have been picture perfect had it been a different pair of arms holding me, a different pair of lips pressed against mine. I had to get Blake out of my room before he noticed how my cheeks reddened, my breath quickened, my mouth quivered as he came closer reaching into a box. So, I grabbed the white t-shirt he'd pulled from the box and busied myself with refolding it, my fingers fumbling. I'm really fine on my own, I said, my voice on edge. I'm sure you have to work. Unpacking is work. Blake's hand skimmed mine when we both turned at the same time to reach into the box. Tingles spread across my skin at the feeling of his warm skin. Gulp. I lifted the box and moved it to the other side of the room, as far from Blake as possible in the suddenly tight space. How was it so hot in here when the air conditioning was set so high? But you have better things to do. I'm sure the golf course is open. It's dark, Griffin. Oh, maybe it'll be open tomorrow, I said, realizing that didn't exactly support my point that he needed to go. As I was stretching to put a scarf and matching pair of gloves on the top shelf of my closet but not quite reaching the high-up shelf, Blake appeared beside me, taking the items and easily placing them on the shelf. I turned to find him smiling down at me. My belly did a cartwheel. Not good, Hannah. So not good. Ducking under his arm, I moved to the makeup spilled across the desk. You must have a newspaper you want to read then? Already read the paper today. He bent over next to me, and as he scooped up a few mascara bottles, I dropped all the makeup and moved to pick them up off the floor. My heart raced. A podcast to listen to? I'd rather listen to you. He grinned as I stared up in surprise at him. Shaking my head, I panicked and my brain overheated or something because I started pulling clothes out of my armoire instead of the boxes. You could learn French, I said. J'adore ta robe. He moved next to me and returned each item I'd pulled out and put them in their proper place in the drawer. You could do a puzzle. I've got a puzzle right here, he said and I eyed him smiling as he looked me over from head to toe and back. I put a hand on my hip. Learn to juggle? Maybe later. Call your parents. Talked to them before I came here. Take Cassandra to the movies, I said, remembering the name of his long-term girlfriend who Lucy had mentioned many times over the years. Blake hesitated. Yeah, I just broke up with Cassandra. I froze, my hair sprayed curls buried in a cardboard box. Blake had been dating Cassandra Bishop forever. Everyone assumed they would get married soon. I'd heard from Lucy's parents that Cassandra and Blake couldn't be more perfect for one another, the ultimate power couple. She was rich, successful, respectable, and very beautiful. Or so I'd heard. She probably wore Christian Louboutin heels and knew how to eat caviar. I resisted the urge to knock my head against the side of the box. It would probably hurt less than shoving my pink sneakers into my mouth. I slowly lifted my head from the box and chewed at my bottom lip. Blake, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. Don't worry about it, he said, shaking his head and slipping his hands into his pockets. You couldn't have known. Really, it's fine. Still, my voice trailed off as I didn't know what else to say. Blake moved to sit on the side of my bed. He leaned forward, resting his forearms on his knees, his hands twisting together. I tripped over my scattered clothes and sat down next to him, scooting away a bit when our hips touched. I realized with some disappointment that Blake had probably just wanted to stick around to vent about his breakup since his sister had to leave. It wasn't because he'd wanted to help me unpack. Still, breakups were hard and I felt bad for him. What happened? I asked. He lifted his head and shrugged. I'll make you a deal. What kind of deal? You let me help you unpack and in return I'll give you my tale of woe. Deal? 
He extended his hand and I hesitated. He saw this and pulled his hand back. You don't have to listen if you don't want to. I just thought. No, I want to, I insisted, placing my hand in his, which made my skin immediately warm. I couldn't tell him I'd hesitated because I was afraid of this exact moment, the heat of his palm against mine. I didn't want him to see how he affected me, even after all these years. I broke the handshake as soon as I could without being rude. But that was a wasted effort, because Blake and I pushed off the bed at the same time and my hand landed right back on top of his. I laughed and hurried to sort through the makeup I'd dropped while he started in on a box from the floor. Maybe not this box, he said. I looked up to see his cheeks red this time as he tilted a box toward me that was filled with my undergarments. Oops. I rushed over and grabbed the box from him. Can you hang those hooks over there? I asked. You don't want me to organize your journal, he said, gesturing to my nightstand where my private journal lay unsuspecting. Um, no. I forced a laugh as I practically choked, because I knew how many times his name had appeared in that journal over the years. You're no fun, he said, moving to the opposite wall and I sighed in relief. So the consensus at my office is that breaking up with Cassandra was a huge mistake, he said, pausing to quickly drive a nail into the wall with a hammer. But it wasn't just this incident that made me break up with her. I've been feeling this way for a long time. You have? I asked, since his family had never mentioned any problems with the ever-perfect Cassandra. Huh. But maybe they're right, he countered. I forced myself to stare at the makeup brushes and not at Blake. You, Hannah Griffin, get to be the deciding vote. My stomach lurched. Oh, no. No, no, no. No pressure, he joked after hammering the next nail into the wall. None at all. I laughed nervously, wondering what this woman had done to make him break up with her. He was the nicest guy ever. She'd obviously blown it, big time. Okay, tell me. So, it started with a black tie charity gala Cassandra and I attended for a local environmental group, he said, squeezing the hammer in his hand. We had a good time, drinking champagne and eating caviar under gold chandeliers. Caviar! I knew it. Blake's classy ex-girlfriend not only could stand the sight of caviar, but she'd eaten the little fishy eggs, and probably liked it. The woman could likely land my client from delicacy knowledge alone. This was the life of luxury I imagined Blake living, all sophistication and wealth and respectability the exact opposite of cheap tool and rhinestones. I tried again to peel off the shiny stone at the corner of my eye. Well, when the evening was over, he said, breaking down an empty box with a little more exertion than necessary, I was moved to do more for the charity, you know? Sure. I nodded, having no idea what he meant. I wanted to get my hands dirty for once instead of just opening my wallet as usual. Ah, yes. That made sense. So, I suggested to Cassandra that we volunteer for the community cleanup the group was holding at the river. What a great idea. Cassandra insisted she was busy, before I even gave her the date. And when I suggested another date, she again said no without even checking her calendar. He stomped on the growing pile of cardboard boxes, flattening them out and I knew she would say no like she did, before I even asked her. I just knew it. I'm sorry, I said, my heart going out to him. He emptied a full box containing more jeans, none of them the designer ones Cassandra surely wore, just to flatten the box between his muscular arms in one swift move. Man, he had some muscles. I hated to admit it, but unpacking was going much faster with him helping after all. I realized that Cassandra doesn't mind attending a gala in an expensive black gown. 
but she wouldn't get to wear a pretty dress cleaning up at the river, so it's just not worth it to her, he said, exhaling a long breath. That's the kind of person she is. Yet everyone at work says I should take her back because we are picture-perfect together. But maybe I'm tired of being picture-perfect with nothing deeper going on, you know? I think so, I said, not wanting to fully commit to their breakup in case they got back together. The thought of watching Blake and his elegant girlfriend come and go, living next door actually made a knot form in my stomach. Blake held up a single pair of white socks. Where do you want these? I pointed to the top drawer of my armoire and he opened it, placed the socks in, and closed it without a sound. He turned to face me. So am I crazy? he asked. I burst out laughing at the question. He raised an eyebrow. Do you see how I'm dressed right now, Blake? I laughed, sweeping my hands across my prom dress and hot pink sneakers. You're asking me if you're crazy? He grinned and then laughed, shaking his head. Maybe I did just jump the gun with Cassandra, he said, pulling a blue flyer out of his pocket and handing it to me. Besides, I paid a lot of money for tickets to this for us. I unfolded the flyer, couples golf charity tournament at the Arbor Grove Country Club. I whistled. Everyone in Sacramento had heard of this tournament, which flooded the news each year. Everyone knew just how exclusive, and just how expensive, it was to participate. Cassandra's parents ran the charity golf tournament each year along with a list of sponsors. I skimmed over the list of names and my mouth dropped open when I spotted Ray Livingston, the self-made millionaire fashion designer and client I was trying to land. What the? My brain percolated as I realized what a fantastic impression I'd make on him if I showed up at the tournament. I knew I could convince him to sign with Haskell and Haskell if he just gave me a chance to make my pitch. He would definitely give me that chance if I showed up at the event of the year. The wheels in my mind were whirling when I realized Blake was saying something. Huh? I said. What do you think? He asked. I looked up from the flyer to find Blake staring down at me, his brown eyes soft in the evening light. What do I think about what? I asked. He tapped the flyer in my hand. Should I give Cassandra another chance and take her to the tournament? I stared up at him and knew I was about to make a huge mistake, perhaps the biggest mistake of my life. Seriously, I should have just unpacked and gone to sleep. Instead, I bit my lower lip and smiled. Or you could take me? Chapter 3 A man in a black suit hurried along the downtown sidewalk carrying a leather briefcase, turned to jet across the street and then glared at the back of Lucy's head when she stopped dead in her tracks in the middle of the crosswalk. He threw his arms up and made a rude comment. Sorry. I waved at the man as I grabbed Lucy's hand and pulled her to safety as the red hand flashed angrily and the man, and many others in business attire, swerved around us. I turned around to continue walking when Lucy stopped me. Wait, 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 she said, shaking her head on the busy street corner. Let me get this straight. Steps, I said, nodding at her legs. I checked the time on my cell phone as I marched in place. We only had 30 minutes left of my lunch hour. We couldn't waste a single moment. Talk and walk. We have to get our steps in. Fine, Lucy agreed, joining me as I marched in place. We received more than a few raised eyebrows and comments whispered under breaths, but, hey, steps are hard to come by when you sit at a desk all day. We got jostled around a bit by people hurrying to get back to the office from lunch. Lucy continued to march and held up a finger as people passed between us. 1. You've never golfed before in your entire life. I nodded. True. She held up another finger. 2. You agreed to participate in the biggest golf tournament of the year in Sacramento with Blake where hundreds of people can see you really mess up? Right. 
I lifted my knees up, down, up, down. I glanced at my steps counter and saw my steps increasing, slowly, steadily. Go, us. Whoa. Lucy jumped back to dodge a stroller, jumping should definitely count as like five steps, and I stumbled when a college kid turned, his backpack nearly smacking into my head. But I got right back into marching, right back into those steps, baby. Ten thousand, here I come. Lucy raised a third finger into the air above the crowd. Three, you definitely aren't doing this because you still have a crush on Blake. Right? My brain immediately flew to the last few mornings outside the townhome when I was leaving for work. Blake just happened to leave at the same time as I did, which was not my fault since I always got out the door first. But he always waved me down and it would have been rude for me not to stop and talk to him, right? And could I be blamed that he and I both got our morning coffees from Courtney Carmichael, an ex-attorney who had burned out on legal work after working 24-7 for decades with only a divorce and a large house in the fabulous 40s neighborhood to show for it? Courtney's coffee cart was her do-over in life and she brightened my mornings with her sparkly tops, upbeat attitude, and the bits of wisdom she dished out with her caramel macchiatos. So, it certainly didn't mean I still had a crush on Blake if I walked with him to Courtney's coffee cart, right? I ducked down and weaved my way through the people hurrying to catch the light and then popped up in front of Lucy. I dragged her along behind me. I don't have a crush on Blake, I said, knowing it would be another one-way street to disappointment if I did. Did I want to relive prom night? No, I did not. As long as you're sure because I'm sure he and Cassandra will get back together. They're like the perfect couple. She came stumbling along as I checked our steps again. We were running out of time, so I pulled her along and quickened my pace. As we swerved around people, she jogged next to me, sucking in breaths. Like I told you, I said, looking over at her, the couple's charity tournament is the best chance I'm going to get at impressing this potential client. It was my one opportunity and I couldn't miss out on it. In essence, my going has nothing to do with Blake. Just saying his name made my heart skip a beat. I'd keep that to myself. A street lamp appeared in my vision as I walked. Lucy and I each went around a different side of the street lamp and met again only to have to split again for a hot dog stand. Hannah, Lucy gasped. It was her turn to drag me along as I looked back rather longingly at the hot dogs. You don't need some fancy event to impress this client. Just be yourself. I turned to Lucy, who clearly didn't get my situation. I left my tenth message for him this morning Lucy and, guess what? I pulled out my phone to show her the screen with zero voicemails. Surprise, surprise, nothing. Noticing we were still behind in our steps, I picked up the pace. Okay, but you don't know how to golf, she said, hurrying to keep up. You'll need lessons to even pass for halfway decent. I know, I said feeling my cheeks redden. Hey, she said, jogging to keep pace after I slid past a small crowd to turn the corner. I could give you lessons this weekend. I'm pretty sure my dad had Blake and me golfing before we even left the hospital. Actually, I already have some lessons scheduled, I said, wanting to immediately change the subject. So, tell me about your date the other night. I nudged Lucy's side and winked. Was he smitten with your prom dress as much as Rob Ellison was in high school? She dismissed my question with a wave of her hand and a sigh. Eh, there's not much to say except there will not be a second date, she said. That was typical with Lucy, no one ever interested her enough for a second date. Plenty of first dates. But she reserved her seconds for chocolate cakes and tiramisus, not men who always seem to disappoint her. Surely there's more to say about the date than just that. I said, making a rather thinly veiled attempt to change the subject, but I figured it was worth a try. 
Lucy and I marched in place as we waited for the light to turn green. Her cheeks were a little red from walking in the bright sun, so I hoped she would just assume that was the cause of my red cheeks, too. You never said who's giving you lessons. Is it someone from the country club? Lucy asked over the honking of a horn as the light changed. Tim? Tim's great if it's him. I nearly sprinted away when the little green walking man appeared on the sign. My first attempt at a subject change was clearly a failure. Um, no, not Tim, I said, as Lucy pulled on my arm to slow me down. Wow, we're so close to our goal. Should we run? Let's run. Let's not run, Lucy said, clutching her side. Are your lessons with Phil then? He's kind of a drill sergeant, but he knows his swing for sure. No, not Phil, I said, shaking my head and staring up at the cloudless sky. It's not with someone who works at the country club actually. She frowned. Oh. We passed a shoe store and I pointed toward the window display. Should we run in for some quick shoe shopping? I asked, using a super excited tone. You love shoe shopping. She shook her head, although I did catch her checking out the window display as we passed by. Why won't you tell me who's giving you lessons, she asked. I acted like I hadn't heard her over the noisy city street. I saw the flyer for the couple's charity tournament that your firm did. Looks like it came together well. Ugh, Hannah, I can't even tell you how much drama went into that one flyer. Lucy threw her hands up and in the process almost whacked an elderly woman next to her. I cringed as Lucy turned her head my way. So, you know how I was assigned to work on all of the promotional materials for the couple's charity tournament, right? Yep. I nodded. Many a step over the last weeks had been stepped discussing this very subject. Lucy was a graphic designer and had been given the opportunity to re-envision the charity tournament's brand concept, which hadn't changed in over two decades. Hannah, Lucy stopped and turned me to face her with a hand on each of my shoulders. Her eyes were intense as she and I marched in place. You know how hard I worked on those designs for the flyers, posters and all, right? I barely saw you for a month, I said, gazing back at her. Our steps seriously suffered. Exactly. She huffed and turned to march forward in frustration. I worked hard and put everything I had into them. I was proud of the end product, which was modern and fresh, while still giving a nod toward the old design. Oh, yeah? I said, raising my eyebrows as I remembered the flyer Blake had showed me. An elderly couple golfing and wearing visors were her idea of modern and fresh. Really? Not that I was going to say anything. And when Blake showed me the flyer he received. Pow. She brought her fist to her chest. Like a bullet to the heart. I saw that they used the old design. So that's why the flyer hadn't seemed modern. Or fresh. She groaned. I worked all that time and they didn't even go with my design. That's terrible. I stopped and didn't march in place this time. Steps were important, but nothing was more important than my friendship with Lucy. I pulled her into a hug. I'm sorry, sweetie, I said, ignoring a grumble from an aggravated passersby that we were blocking the sidewalk. Couldn't they see we were having a BFF moment? What are you going to do? I asked. She shrugged. I don't know what there is to do at this point. The flyers are all printed, the posters are already up around town, and the media already has all the old designs sent out. But what about the main archway to the club? I asked, remembering the news comments that every year the entrance to the couple's charity tournament was marked with a beautiful archway that was always quite a spectacle. And it was always the same. Lucy drummed her fingers along her chin. 
I don't know how I would even start to convince my boss when he completely dismissed me the first time. It's like he's out to get me. I sighed. Tell me about it. The two of us each contemplated our own work dilemmas, forcing the crowd to go around us when Lucy suddenly looked up at me. That reminds me. You never did tell me who is giving you those golf lessons. I blushed all over again. This time she definitely noticed. Hannah Griffin, she said, pointing a finger at me. You tell me right now. Okay, I said, holding my palms up. But it doesn't mean anything, okay? I watched realization dawn on her face. You're getting lessons from. He's just giving me golf lessons as a favor, I said, quickly. As a friend. Her eyes grew wider and she started to bounce up and down. Does this mean? No, I said, shaking my head adamantly. This doesn't mean I still have a crush on Blake. That ended a long time ago. But a grin spread across Lucy's face. I shook my head. Don't even think it. Hannah likes Blake, she said, using a sing-song tone. Hannah likes Blake. Rolling my eyes, I turned and hurried away from her through the crowd. Where are you going? She called after me. Got to get those steps in. I shouted back. I'll see you at home. Okay, I may have run away from Lucy at full speed, but only because my lunch hour was up. Not because she was suggesting I still had feelings for her brother. I mean, I needed to learn how to golf. Blake knew how to golf. Voila. It was merely a convenience thing, nothing more than that. Nothing more than a few lessons so I could impress my client. That was it. Really. That was it. When I returned to my office, sweaty and breathless, my phone beeped. I pulled out my cell and saw a text message from Lucy, Hannah likes Blake. Hannah likes Blake, winky face. I would have written her back denying it but an imagine of Blake giving me lessons popped into my mind. His arms around me, guiding my swing, and then his espresso brown eyes peering down at me as he smiled. My belly did a little flip. I was so in trouble. Chapter 4 the night before my first golf lesson with Blake, I skipped reality TV, popcorn tossed with chocolate and a healthy dose of Pinot Gris with the girls in order to hunker down at the desk in my mostly unpacked room to watch the golf channel. Shudder. It wasn't that I didn't like sports. I'd played recreational softball all the way through college. I liked to watch a football game just as much as baking cookies on a lazy Sunday afternoon and I enjoyed going for a power walk as much as clothes shopping during a major sale, well, almost as much. The problem with golf was the speed, or, more specifically, the lack thereof. And why were the commentators always whispering? And why did golfers drive their carts at a snail's pace? And why did they take so long to swing? Just hit the ball already. Anyway, I spent the evening watching the golf channel and consequently listening to my friend's laughter wafting up the stairs while I worked my way through a 40-ounce water bottle to hydrate for the next day on the course. As I watched golf and tried to stay awake, I had poured every 8 ounces of water into a wine glass to make it enjoyable, but I reminded myself this was for a good cause. I truly did want to give it my all to impress this potential client. No matter how many times I fell asleep watching the game on the golf channel, I was determined to look like I belonged out there on the golf course. I could be a country club girl if I tried hard enough. Well, if I dressed appropriately and didn't make a total fool of myself. The next morning, I woke up and poked my head into Lucy's room. Lucy? You awake? She grumbled in response, rolled over, and then her head disappeared under the covers. I sneaked over to the bed and tickled the ball of her foot, which was poking out from the bottom of her bedspread. Whatever she grumbled was muffled into her pillow. 
I need your help, Lucy, I whispered, poking at the lump under the comforter. What am I supposed to wear? Huh? To the country club, I said, poking her again and wondering how late they stayed up last night having fun while I'd fallen asleep at my desk watching golf. Am I supposed to wear a pearl necklace or something? M. Lucy mumbled under the covers. Pearls? Really? I was actually kidding. M. If you say so, I said, shrugging. I borrowed a pearl necklace from Lucy's jewelry box and then hurried to meet Blake, who said he was going to the club early and that he'd meet me there. When I arrived, the horizon still had just a hint of the prettiest pink as I waited for him in the golf cart I was told was his. I had to admit that the long stretches of green glistening with morning dew and dotted with pockets of perfect white sand looked picturesque. The trees lining the course had bright green leaves, making me wonder if they'd soaked up most of the California water supply. Must have cost a fortune with our never-ending droughts. My brain's whirling thoughts of winning over my potential client and my need for job security to put me on the right career path silenced momentarily as I admired the beauty of the quiet course. The golf course was that peaceful. Of course, the moment I saw Blake with his golf bag slung over his broad shoulders, my brain jumped right back into hyperdrive. I needed to focus. I needed to learn. I needed to get the golf game right and get it right quickly. So, I turned the key in the ignition and was ready to put the pedal to the metal when Blake walked up to the passenger side. Instead of jumping in so we could race off to the first hole, he leaned against the cart. Hang on a moment. He chuckled as he set the golf clubs down. Easy there, speed racer. I blinked, wishing he weren't so attractive. Okay. He reached toward me and switched off the ignition. I couldn't help but notice how good he smelled, his hair still slightly wet from a shower. He wore a blue athletic collared shirt that complemented his tan skin and hugged his muscular shoulders very nicely. I reminded myself I was here for golf lessons and golf lessons alone as he slipped the golf cart keys into the pocket of his khakis and then held out his hand for me. I raised an eyebrow. We're not golfing? I asked, nodding in the direction of the flag marking the first hole. We're golfing, he said, stretching his hand toward me. We just won't be needing the golf cart. With apprehension, I took his hand, and a little zing zipped through my belly. Lesson number one, it's more enjoyable to walk the course, he said, his mouth curving upward as we started toward the flag marking the first hole with his hand wrapped around mine. You know best, I said, not wanting to inform him that it was also much slower this way. The golf cart meant more holes faster and more time for practice. But I trusted Blake. And I wanted to be a good student. Plus, I'd get my steps in this way. I might end up unemployed within the month, but at least I'd be fit. My hand felt so nice in Blake's that I was disappointed when we reached the first hole and he let go. He'd never held my hand before, but he was probably just trying to put me at ease since I was a new golfer. Just a friendly gesture. That had to be it. Right? Okay, Blake said, clapping his hands together. Why don't you show me your swing? We'll see what we're dealing with that way. Right, I said, walking over to his set of clubs. I pulled out the one I hoped was the driver. I might have snoozed a teeny tiny bit while conducting my golf channel research, but the driver seemed like the easiest club to recognize. I raised an eyebrow as I held it up. He nodded. So far so good, Griffin. Thanks, I said, feeling a little confused. The way he called me by my last name reminded me of the times he'd teased Lucy and me as kids. But the way he smiled at me didn't make me feel at all like just his little sister's friend. It made me feel like he saw me as a beautiful woman. But maybe that was wishful thinking. Let's see what you've got, he said, kneeling down to push a tea into the green earth of the tea box. 
he pulled out a white golf ball and set it on the head of the tee. At the very least I knew this was the point where I was supposed to whack that ball as far as I could down the fairway. As I lined up the head of the club with the ball, Blake came over. Now, just remember, he said, laying his hand over mine. You might not hit it perfectly the first time. And that's okay. We just have to be patient. Before my mind could break down, analyze, obsess over and go crazy trying to figure out what Blake meant by we, I managed to nod at him. I'll keep that in mind. Good. He smiled and held up his hands, stepping back. With Blake a safe distance away, I focused on the golf ball and then on the flag in the distance past a long stretch of perfectly manicured grass. I wiggled my legs the way I saw the golfers do on the golf channel and sucked in a deep breath. How hard could it be to hit that ball? I mean, how hard could it really be? It was just like softball, only with a skinnier bat and a smaller ball. I could do this. As I swung the club back, I pictured the ball sailing over that trimmed green grass and dropping a few feet from the hole. Then I swung as hard as I could and whiffed. My face heated and I glanced over at Blake. He nodded toward the ball, which was still sitting on the tee, mocking me. But Blake wasn't folded over in laughter at my sad attempt. He just gestured for me to get back to the ball. Try again, he said, with no hint of laughter in his voice. That wasn't a bad swing. I guffawed. Um, I missed the ball completely and possibly got whiplash. How isn't that bad? Trust me, he said, nodding toward the ball. The swing was good, just a little high. This time keep your eye on the ball. Adjusting my feet and sighing, I refocused. It was simple, club to ball, ball to hole. I could do this. I swung and my club collided with the ground, causing a clump of dirt to spring forward. Oops, I said, staring in horror at the gouge in the ground. The ball remained on the tee, and I pictured it in giggles. Whatever, ball. You've got plenty of power, Griffin. That's for sure, he said, patting me on the back. Keep your eye on the back of the ball. Keep it there the entire time. Try again. So pathetic, I muttered, imagining the look on my client's face if he were to see me miss the ball during the tournament. He'd totally want to listen to my presentation after seeing that debacle. No doubt. Right. I bent over and dropped my forehead to the top of the club's handle. Hannah, Blake crouched down until he was looking in my eyes, an amused grin on his handsome face. His beautiful brown eyes were filled with kindness and patience. You've only swung the club twice. I know. I squeezed my eyes shut and tapped my forehead against the club. I'm scared the third time will be even worse. He chuckled and lifted my chin with his finger. Did you expect to be Tiger Woods after two swings? He asked. I considered the question and started to laugh. Yeah, I guess I kind of did. I pictured the ball dropping right next to the hole. He shook his head. Maybe we should give it at least three tries before we go expecting to win any PGA Tours, huh? Letting out a long breath, I nodded and stood. Blake placed his hands on my shoulders. Ready to try again? I grinned. Ready. His smile made me feel like I could strap the clubs to my back, sprint to the coast, swim across the Pacific, climb MT Fuji, tee off and hit the ball all the way back into the first hole at Arbor Grove Country Club. I just couldn't tell if he'd smiled at me like that because he was a nice guy or because he maybe, just maybe liked me. I breathed in deeply and focused as I started my swing. The club glanced off the golf ball this time, sending it bouncing a few feet forward. Feelings of defeat threatened to flood my chest until Blake gave a loud whistle and a cheer. My eyebrows rose as I looked over at him. Good job! I looked back to my ball and laughed. 
I barely hit it. But you hit it this time, didn't you? He sauntered over, picked up the ball, and placed it back on the tee. Progress, Griffin. We can work with that. There was that wee word again that made my legs go all gooey, especially when he moved to stand behind me. My breath quickened. Let's start with your hands, he said, quietly into my ear. Place your dominant hand at the shaft. Then put this hand here. And your thumb, here, he said, moving his hands over mine, making butterflies flutter in my belly. How was I supposed to focus on golf with his hands on mine? Not so tight, he said. I loosened my death grip, shifting my head to see his eyes. I'm afraid the club will go flying behind me if my hands are too loose. You have to trust yourself. Trust myself, I nodded, looking away before I could get lost counting his long, thick eyelashes. He released me, but then his hands moved to my shoulders, which sent goosebumps down my spine despite the growing heat of the early morning. Keep your head still. You're turning it when you swing. Okay. My voice nearly squeaked. Pull this shoulder back. He eased my right shoulder back. Perfect. Just like that. I was trying really hard to remember everything he was saying, but the sound of his voice was hypnotizing me, not to mention his hands on me. When you swing, he said, his hands sliding down to my arms, don't stop when you hit the ball. Swing through it. Okay, I said, gulping. Then his hands moved to my hips and I seriously thought I was going to pass out. Focus on your balance, he said, gripping my waist as I rocked slightly from heel to toe. You're falling back on your heels a bit. Find that balance and try to hold on to it. Balance, I said, weakly. He tried to move me, but I stayed steady, balanced on the soles of my shoes. Perfect. As he moved to stand in front of me, his hand slid across my lower back before dropping to his side. Electricity coursed between us as he looked down at me. He smiled at me. Don't rush your swing at the top. Patience, right? I smiled back at him. You know I don't do patience very well. He laughed and stepped back to give me room. Trust me, Griffin, I know, he said, nodding at the ball on the tee. Try again. And that's how we spent the morning, me failing, him instructing, me failing a little less, him encouraging me, me not entirely failing, him patiently moving my body this way and that, me trying not to pass out. The golf channel wouldn't have been at all boring if Blake had been there with me. I seriously had more fun with Blake that morning than I had in years. Despite my sad attempts, we would end up laughing and he never gave up hope that I could improve. This is going to be your best drive of the day, he said, as we approached the final hole. I focused, trying to remember everything he'd taught me, wanting to impress him, I mean, wanting to impress Ray Livingston. I held my body steady, focused on the back of the ball and then swung. The ball sailed through the air and I watched its trajectory with wide eyes. Yes, yes, yes. Blake cheered as the ball flew upward in a beautiful, tall, arc, and then straight into a window on the second floor of the clubhouse. My mouth dropped open. I glanced over at Blake, his eyes met mine, and then he burst out laughing. He hadn't laughed a single time despite all my terrible swings and horrible putts, but here I go breaking a window and he's laughing hysterically. Blake, I whispered, the corners of my mouth pulling upward. This isn't funny. He walked over and placed an arm over my shoulder. I'm sorry, Griffin, he said, still chuckling as he led us toward the clubhouse. You're just really cute when you're breaking windows. Don't worry about the damage. I'll pay for the replacement. Cute? Did he say I was cute? Next time we'll work on AIM, he said, making us both burst into laughter.
As we walked up the steps to the clubhouse, our conversation turned to lighter things like what he was reading and my favorite TV shows. Right then I realized I needed to perfect my golf swing soon, very soon. Because after only one lesson, I'd moved on from crush to falling head over heels for my best friend's older brother, which had ended in heartbreak the last time. Chapter 5 After several more golf lessons from Blake, which I enjoyed way more than any student should, the day of the couple's golf charity tournament finally arrived. I was pleased to see that the main archway to the club boasted a modern and fresh version of the tournament's brand concept. Go, Lucy! I adjusted the waistband of the golf skirt I'd borrowed from Lucy, hoping to fit in with the bustling Arbor Grove Country Club crowd. As if sensing my nervousness, Blake looked down at me with slight concern in his coffee brown eyes. I forced a quick smile for him, before returning my gaze to the scene around me. Not even the bright, clear blue skies, stunning acres of freshly trimmed grass, and soft breezes could quell the unease I felt as I searched through the who's who of Sacramento for Mr. Livingston, the potential client I wanted to impress. No, the client I needed to impress this afternoon in order to keep my job. I didn't see him though. I spotted people with golf clubs slung casually over their shoulders joking easily with one another. Couples lounging in golf carts. Others taking deviled eggs and glasses of mimosas from the staff, who were wearing white collared shirts. This was my chance to get Mr. Livingston's attention. Maybe he hadn't arrived yet? Let's go over what we learned last week, Blake said, pulling out a putter and handing it to me. I'm ready, I said, leaning to the side to see if that was Mr. Livingston I saw standing behind the table which was stacked with fresh strawberries, kiwis, oranges, and slices of honeydew, cantaloupe, and more melons than I could name. I only glanced up when Blake's fingers slid over mine as he wrapped my hand gently around the putter. Butterflies invaded my belly. His face was close to mine and he smiled down at me. We had grown closer over our morning walks to work and the golf lessons for the tournament. After all his hard work, I hoped I didn't blow it today. It's just you and me, he whispered, his lips close to my ear, despite some odd looks thrown his way from a group standing nearby. Right? Wrong, I said, sweeping my hand toward the crowd and pulling back from him as I wondered who the people in the group were. It's you, me, and all these people who have been golfing since they were in gold-plated diapers. Gold? he asked, laughing at my joke. I take offense. My diapers were platinum-plated. Figures, I said, smiling. He grinned and moved to stand behind me as he had so many times during our private lessons together. And just like all those times the feel of him brushing against me sent chills up and down my arms. Despite the warm weather, I wished I'd asked Lucy for a long sleeve sweater instead of the cute white athletic tank top she insisted I wear. I was afraid Blake would see the goosebumps and know that I liked him. That I really liked him. He stretched his chin over my shoulder and his hands grazed down my arms to rest over my grip on the putter. His strong, solid chest was steadying against the frantic racing of my heart. I tried to look up to search for Mr. Livingston, but Blake's words in my ear brought me back to his gentle hands on mine. Eyes on your target, he said. Back of the ball. I nodded and glanced over at the hole on the small putting green. No one else was using it, probably because no one else was attempting to be proficient in golf in less than two weeks. That would just be me. But soon my eyes drifted as my mind thought of how important it was to my career that I impress Mr. Livingston at the tournament today. Loosen up, he grinned, his cheek against mine. Then he leaned down to tap the backs of my knees. That instruction didn't really help, because when he touched me I froze like a deer in the headlights. I'm trying to relax, I said. Easy does it. He whispered as he guided my arms back and then swung the putter forward to tap the golf ball at my feet. I watched it roll across the green in a straight line until it finally plopped into the hole on the first stroke. I turned around and grinned at Blake. It worked! See? 
He smiled, brushing a loose stand of hair behind my ear. You and me. I supped in a deep, steadying breath and nodded. You and me. As I was looking at Blake, I had no desire to search for anyone else, not even Mr. Livingston. Blake was the only one I wanted to be with today. He opened his mouth to say something, but was interrupted by a woman calling his name. He glanced over my shoulder and then his facial muscles tightened. What the? I turned to see a beautiful woman striding toward us in a confident and purposeful manner. Somehow, the wind blew her hair back in a sexy way like a fan at a runway show while that same wind blew my hair into my clear lip gloss. The woman was tall, thin, impeccably dressed and wore a smile that told everyone she knew she looked amazing. Cassandra, Blake said, as she pressed a red lipstick kiss on each of his cheeks. My heart sank. This was Cassandra Bishop? Blake's ex-girlfriend? She could be Shailene Woodley's twin. How was I supposed to compete with someone who looked like her? Blake, it's been far too long, a husky male voice said, an older man coming up behind Cassandra to shake Blake's hand. Confusion and surprise colored Blake's expression. Mr. Bishop, nice to see you. Cassandra's father. Great. Not like I wanted to be here in the middle of the reunion. My body went numb as I stood silently, watching Blake and Cassandra. Was there awkwardness due to my being here? As if in answer, Cassandra turned to me, gave me a radiant smile, and then handed her golf clubs to me. For some unknown reason, I took them even as my mouth dropped open a little. Then she pulled a hundred dollar bill out of her wallet and handed that over to me as well. Uh, huh? I muttered, unintelligently. I'm not really chatty with my caddy, dear, she said, pulling out a compact mirror to check her lipstick. And I don't want your advice on shots unless I ask for it. Nothing personal. I just take my own shots in life. You know? I opened my mouth to say something, but then closed it as Cassandra turned to Blake and laid her manicured hand on his chest. He didn't push it away. Blake, darling, you're not golfing alone, are you? She asked, her fingers trailing down to his ABS where is your partner? He grabbed her wrist and moved her hand from his chest. I do have a partner, she. Because daddy can golf with mommy if you'd like to golf with me. Just like we were always supposed to do, darling. Cassandra, I have a partner, Blake said, taking her golf clubs from where they sat in front of me and placing them back in front of Cassandra. Then he placed an arm around my shoulders and pulled me against him. Oh, snap. You're golfing with the caddy? Cassandra raised an eyebrow, but didn't raise it as high as she'd raised her incredulous voice. Cassandra. Stop. She's not the caddy and you know it, he said, irritation clear in his voice. This is my partner, Hannah. A flash of anger played in Cassandra's deep green eyes, which I noted were the color of carnivorous plants. Beautiful, but deadly. She quickly recovered from his tone and turned to me again, this time with an ice-cold condescending smile. Hannah. I swallowed and extended a hand that I hoped wasn't too sweaty. Hannah Griffin. Cassandra didn't take my hand but instead leaned away from me and crossed her arms. Sorry, I don't know the name. Who are your parents? I assume they're club members as well. Blake shook his head. Hannah has been Lucy's best friend since they were kids. Oh, Lucy's friend, Cassandra said, as if she understood clearly now. You brought your little sister's bestie with you since you didn't have a date. How cute. I blinked. Cute? I do hope your babysitting rates have increased, darling, she said, in a voice one would use for a joke as she turned to Blake. I didn't find it funny. So are we going to golf or what? I asked, done with listening to this woman insult me. 
I slung my set of golf clubs over my shoulder. After you, Cassandra said. No, after you, I spit out through a clenched jaw. Let's go together, shall we? Blake placed a hand on my lower back. He leaned toward my ear as we walked. I'm sorry about this. She's trying to get into your head. It's not going to work, I said, noting Cassandra was walking behind us. Nobody gets into my head. Well, except for Unicorn Dolly, he said. I stared up at him in shock. You remember the name of my imaginary friend? He laughed. How could I forget? My heart fluttered. I'm touched, I said, seriously. Listen, no matter what Cassandra says, you're not a little girl anymore, he said, slipping his arm around my shoulder and stopping me for a moment. You're a strong, smart, sometimes really weird. I punched him playfully in the arm. He pretended to be in pain. I mean, a really strong, beautiful woman. And you're going to kill it out there, right? Had he just said I was beautiful? Me? The Anna Kendrick compared to Shailene Woodley? As if on cue, Cassandra strolled by with her father and called over her shoulder, I thought we were doing this, darling. I turned to Blake, competition flaring within me. Let's do this. Right, he said. At the first hole I watched as Cassandra drove the ball down the fairway farther than I had ever hit it, even on my best swing during practice with Blake. It figured she'd be good at everything she did. Let's go, Hannah, Blake said, clapping as I set my ball on the tee. I noticed that Blake hadn't called me by my last name the way he had when we were kids or even over the past few days. Maybe living next door to him was making him start to see me as more than his little sister's bestie as Cassandra put it. Maybe he was starting to see me as a grown, confident woman. If so, I needed to confirm this new assessment with a rock and swing ASAP. I stared at the back of the ball, thinking that I could do this. I could totally do this. Remembering everything Blake taught me and finding some extra juice from my competitive spirit, I lifted my club back and then swung. Somehow the club connected with the ball and a satisfying click reverberated through the air. I watched my ball arch into the air and drive down the fairway. Blake cheered and even Mr. Bishop whistled as we all watched my ball slide just a few inches past Cassandra's ball. Hey, a head was a head. I'd take it. Cassandra remained silent. Suppressing my grin and jaw drop, for that matter, I turned around just as Blake scooped me into massive hug, picked me up and twirled me in the air. Let's keep it classy, eh, Blake, darling? Cassandra said, using a bored tone as she followed her father toward the balls. As we walked toward the putting green the first beamed in the glory of my mighty conquest. Blake chatted with Mr. Bishop about business and his parents and the stock market. Cassandra walked alongside them until she dropped back with me. You know, she said, giving me a slow smile, you seem like such a sweet friend to Blake. I glanced up at her, trying to read her expression, which seemed to only hold a genuine smile. Thanks, I said, deciding to give her the benefit of the doubt that she meant what she said, despite her many snotty comments thus far. But, hey, she didn't know me. And I was with someone who had recently dumped her. That had to be a tough situation to handle. Blake and I have been friends for a long time. Since childhood. She raised her index finger and placed it against her mouth as if she were thinking of just the right words to say. It's good that he's had a friend like you during our break. I waited for her to add the word up after the word break, but nothing. She was supposed to say break up. There was a huge difference between break up and break and I really wanted her to confirm the last part of the word just like Blake had told me. Unfortunately, she didn't say anything further. Two little letters haunted me as we neared the second hole. Um, I said, turning to Cassandra with my heart pounding. 
but I had to know the full story. I thought you two had called it quits. No, silly goose. She laughed and dismissed my statement with a wave of her elegant hand. We've just been taking a little break because we've both been so busy with our successful careers. I also wanted more time for some individualized charity work. You know, giving back is so important these days. Right, I tilted my head as my mind raced. Blake had said Cassandra was not into charity work unless it involved a social event. Had they had a follow-up conversation wherein they talked about getting back together but Blake hadn't told me? Blake and I really want to be a couple with our priorities straight, you know? She continued, but I barely heard her over the rushing in my ears. I stared at Blake's back, mentally imploring him to confirm or deny what Cassandra was saying. Charity is so important to both of us. Huh, I said, thinking this certainly didn't sound like a breakup. So, I'm very happy he has had a little friend during this time of space. She patted my back and smiled before taking her place next to her ball. Blake moved to stand beside me and I shifted away, as if his arm were a hot iron. What's wrong? he asked. I'm planning where I want the um, the um. The ball? Blake asked, his mouth half amused grin, half confused frown. Right, I said, moving away even further. Right, where I want the ball to go. Cassandra hit the ball straight into the hole before it was Blake's turn. I watched as she brushed her fingers down his arm as he walked to his ball. Had I heard Blake wrong about breaking up with Cassandra? Had I wanted to hear him say they were done so badly that I'd missed something important? Like a future reconciliation? Had he truly just said they were on a break? My head was spinning, just like it had been spinning since I'd gotten this promotion. Clearly I'd been imagining the permanent status of their breakup. The stress from my job had fried my brain and I'd understood it wrong. A knot formed in my stomach, but I had to admit that Cassandra seemed perfect for Blake in every way that I was not. His family thought so and everyone at his work thought so. Who was I to hope for a guy who was already taken? You're up, young lady, Mr. Bishop said, giving me a polite gesture toward the ball. I blinked, having almost forgotten where I was until I saw Cassandra whisper to Blake about something. And he nodded his head. Suddenly, I felt like a third wheel. And we were in a foursome, so that was saying something. I wiped the sweat from my hands twice before I could grip the putter decently. Everything Blake had taught me flew from my head. All I could think about was the two of them together as a couple on a Christmas card I'd receive while living next door to him and how perfect that picture would look. My grip tightened and when I swung and hit the ball, it might have been a tad too hard. The ball sped wide of the hole and flew down a steep hill straight into a sand trap. Yep, too hard. Missed by a bit, Cassandra said, oh so not helpfully. Without a word, I marched where my ball sat in the sand. Blake said, Hannah. I got it, I called back without looking at him. Tears pricked at my eyes as I swung and watched the ball bounce forward a mere few inches in a billow of sand before rolling right back to hit my toes. I whacked at that ball again and again, swinging more and more wildly each time. But the ball never moved more than a few inches, if I even managed to make contact with the sucker. Hannah, that's good, Blake called. I heard Cassandra chuckling, which made me determined to get that ball out of the sand trap. I chopped and chopped, but no luck. Arg! Dear, the next group is coming. We really must be moving on, Mr. Bishop said, but I ignored him as sand flooded over my shoes. I couldn't give up. I had to make it back to the hole back to where I'd been. I just had to. I'd been so happy for a short while and now I was trapped in the sand. If it took all afternoon I was going to get my ball back to that hole and then maybe it would fill that hole gaping in my chest. But the next time I went to whack the ball it wasn't there. 
I blinked. Huh? My head lifted slowly until I saw the ball in Blake's hand as he stared at me with a line between his eyebrows. Hannah, he said, clearing his throat and gesturing behind him. The other group is here. They've been waiting and came to see what the commotion was about. You gave it a good try, but we have to go to the next hole now. He nodded his head toward the edge of the sand pit where Cassandra and her father stood with two other couples, who had apparently pulled up in their carts to watch me go head to head with my little white nemesis. I nearly gasped in horror when I recognized the shocked face of Mr. Livingston. How long had the man I was here to impress with my sophisticated demeanor and respectful manners and expensive clothes been standing there, watching me with a sweaty forehead and red cheeks and aggravated grunts whacking at the golf ball like a crazy person? As I stared at Mr. Livingston, I knew that he'd been there long enough to know I'd never impress him now. Well, there. Mr. Livingston drummed his fingers along his putter. That certainly was quite interesting. Heat flooded my cheeks. Oh, no. My entire purpose for these golf lessons was now ruined. If my work situation had been bad before, then now it was ten times worse. Or a hundred times worse. I seriously hated to assess how bad I'd made the sitch. So, I grabbed my ball, climbed out of the sand pit, and hurried past Blake who watched me with questioning eyes. I said nothing as I fought to hold back my tears on the way to the next hole. Your form back there needs work, Cassandra said, once Blake was out of earshot. I wouldn't mind giving you some lessons. It can't hurt. No, thanks, I said, since I obviously wouldn't be golfing again anytime soon. Well, if you change your mind. I love charity work, she added, before falling back to walk alongside Blake, leaving me alone. I'd blown my one shot with Mr. Livingston because of my feelings for a guy who was already spoken for. The rest of the tournament included the following thrilling entertainment, watching my club sail into a tree when it slipped from my sweaty palms, missing every single par on every single hole by no less than three, and imagining the least terrible way to inform my boss that Mr. Livingston would most definitely not be signing with Haskell and Haskell now. Oh, how could I forget? In my quest to not break down, I smiled and laughed like someone on a sugar high, while straining to hold back the tears. I hoped to convince everyone that I wasn't completely and utterly heartbroken about Cassandra getting back together with Blake. Blake, come to dinner with us, Mr. Bishop said after our final hole. You certainly shot well enough to deserve a nice steak at the club's restaurant. Mr. Bishop's back was to me as I fiddled with my clubs and that was more than enough indication to realize I wasn't invited. Fine by me. The tears I'd held back all afternoon threatened to fall again, so I turned and walked off. But before I could reach the solitude of my car a hand on my arm stopped me. Where are you off to in such a hurry, Griff? Blake stopped abruptly, his brown eyes filling with concern. What's wrong? I swiped my cheeks. Nothing, just the sun in my eyes, I lied. The sun sank down behind Blake and he turned around in obvious confusion to stare at the vibrant colors stretching across a tranquil lake in the front of the country club. But you were walking in the opposite direction, he said, turning back to face me. Hannah, please, tell me what's wrong. He placed a hand on my shoulder, so sweetly, so gently, but this only made the tears fall faster. A bee bit me, I choked out through the tightness in my throat. A bee didn't bite you, Blake said calmly, without judgment. I got sunscreen in my eyes. Hannah. I'm on my period. Blake sighed and crossed his arms. Hannah Griffin, you tell me the truth right now, he insisted. Tell me why you're sad. Flustered and emotionally drained, I flung my arms wide and shouted, because I like you. Almost immediately I regretted letting the words slip out that like that. I never should have told him. I never should have admitted how I felt. I should have left in my car and bought a pint of ice cream and cried myself to sleep like a sane gal would do. 
I clasped my hands over my face in horror as Blake silently stood there, staring at me. And why is that wrong? he asked, his voice soft. No, I mean I like you like you. I parted my fingers in time to see him step closer to me through blurry eyes. He took my wrists and pulled my hands away from my face. My heart leaped when he held them against his chest. The corner of his mouth lifted. Like I said, what is so wrong with that? What? I could hardly breathe as he leaned down, his mouth pausing an inch from mine, as my belly did a little flip. Then he closed the space between us and pressed his lips to mine. My eyelids fluttered shut as I savored the feeling of his mouth against mine, soft and sweet. Then, my mind started working again and I pulled back. What about Cassandra? I asked. His eyebrows rose. I told you, we broke up. But. There is no Cassandra, Hannah, he said, looking into my eyes with that same look he gave me the night of prom. My heart melted. I told you earlier, there is only you and me. He pulled me in again, caressed my cheek, and then pressed his mouth to mine. I sank into his kiss, my body melting into his as my fingers splayed across his chest. I could feel his heart beat against my fingers. It was racing like mine. Wait, wait, I said, pushing Blake away and checking over his shoulder at the large glass windows of the country club. Everyone can see us. Every family friend Blake knew from childhood, every lawyer at his father's prestigious firm, every influential person in Sacramento's elite, everyone who was anyone could see Blake kissing me, a verifiable nobody. Blake glanced over his shoulder, blinking against the dying beams of sunlight piercing through the brilliant pink and yellow clouds. Then he returned his gaze to me, his eyes brightening like those last golden rays. I waited for him to step back, to nod and agree it wouldn't be a good idea for his professional image to be here with me like this. But he didn't. He only grinned. Good, he said, before pulling me back into the warmth of another kiss. Chapter 6 Sitting in Blake's Mercedes, I twirled the soft curls Lucy had put in my hair for my date. She'd done my makeup, too, but I'd vetoed the blue eye shadow this time. I frowned when we passed the freeway exit for the country club. I pulled against the tug of the seatbelt as I turned to watch the sign disappear in the darkening twilight of that warm summer evening. Um, I think you missed the exit. I threw my thumb over my shoulder, pointing to the receding sign behind us. Blake gave me a wink. We're not going to the country club tonight. No? I raised an eyebrow at his mischievous grin. Where are we going then? His only response was to slip his fingers in between mine and raise my hand to his lips. My belly did a cartwheel. After all these years, I was on a date with Blake Remington. He pulled into the driveway of his parents' house, mansion is probably more accurate, in the fabulous 40s neighborhood and parked out in front. Then he walked around the car to open my door. I hesitated before taking his extended hand. I hadn't been back to this house since prom night and it felt unreal that I would be here on a date with Blake, the guy I'd crushed on my whole life and the person I'd watched walk away from me. When we entered the foyer, I glanced up at the top of the grand spiral staircase and remembered the way I'd felt when I saw him standing right where he stood now. When I was silent for a moment, he cleared his throat. Um, I hope it's all right, but I really wanted to cook for you. My new kitchen doesn't have any pots and pans yet and my parents are gone for the evening so I thought this would be okay. But by the look on your face I'm thinking I may have blown it. Are you okay? Is this okay? I blinked and shook my head before giving him a reassuring smile. It's totally fine. That's sweet of you to want to cook for me. I didn't even know you knew how. Well, that remains to be seen, he said, chuckling. He pressed some buttons on the stereo and then soft jazz played from the kitchen's built-in speakers. Blake poured us each a glass of wine. 
Cheers. I lifted my glass and clinked it into his. Cheers. I sipped the purple Merlot that surely cost more than my paycheck as I watched Blake slice fresh cherry tomatoes he'd picked from the garden out back that rivaled Versailles. Not that I'd ever been to France, of course. But I'd seen pictures. We chatted easily as he cooked, dismissing my offer to help. Garlic and olive oil simmered on the stove and a large pot of homemade pasta boiled next to it. He looked hot in his apron and I couldn't be blamed for staring as I took another sip of wine. He glanced up at me from the cutting board when I laughed suddenly. What? He smiled. Nothing, I said, shaking my head. It's just that the last time someone made a meal for me it was mac and cheese with hot dogs. A delicacy, I'm told. He pulled out fresh basil and then brushed his fingers across my cheek, sending shivers down my spine. As I sipped my wine, I watched as a strand of light brown hair fell over his focused dark brown eyes. His fingers moved with such care, such gentleness, and such devotion over the herbs. People sometimes mistook Blake for being rigid or serious or stern. But I knew differently. He was all heart. And when he threw his heart into something, he threw it in all the way. I hopped up onto the island counter, swinging my legs like I used to do growing up when Lucy and I had baked cookies. Blake, can I tell you something? He added the tomatoes to the pan and tossed them as flames licked up the sides. He glanced over his shoulder at me. I should have bought hot dogs, he asked, that sly twinkle in his eye. I rolled my eyes and attempted to throw a basil leaf at him. He grinned when it fell between us onto the counter. Not about hot dogs. It's something I've never told you before. Leaving the stovetop, he crossed the distance and stood between my legs, my toes skimming his tailored pants. He took a sip out of my wine glass and then set it on the counter, looking at me with those focused, dedicated eyes. If I had my way, you'd tell me anything and everything you've never told me before. I smiled. Even if it takes all night? He brushed my hair behind my ear and his fingers skimmed along the side of my neck. Even if it takes all my nights, he said. My belly did a little flip. I picked up my wine glass, my fingers wrapping tightly around the stem. Judging by the whites of my knuckles, perhaps a little too tightly. In some ways I was completely comfortable with Blake, but in others I was totally nervous, especially to open up to him on our first official date. I took in a bracing breath. You probably won't remember this. I mean, there's no reason you should, but for my senior prom when I dumped Tommy, you came here for the weekend from Stanford and you were wearing the silver and black dress with the poofy skirt that was just like you, fun and sweet and unique. My eyes bulged. I can't believe you remember that, oh, right. You saw it a couple weeks ago when I was unpacking with Lucy, I said, feeling stupid that I thought he'd remembered all this time. When you came down the stairs you had a rhinestone star, right here, he said, brushing the skin near my eye, heating my skin where he touched. You wore those pink sneakers and you smelled like strawberries and cream. That was the flavor of my lotion, I said, unable to believe his memory. He put a finger under my chin and I ducked a little, worried that if I stared too long into his brown eyes then this dream would end, just like it had all those years ago when I left with Tommy. Blake remembered that night clearly. And I couldn't believe it. I wanted to go with you to prom, I whispered. But then Tommy came back and you immediately stepped away. I figured you saw me as just your little sister's little friend and you were always teasing us and... Hannah. I spoke quickly now, all that emotion from that disappointment pouring out, and you said prom was for kids and... Hannah, he said, firmly, making me blink. I wanted to go with you to prom, too. This stopped me the words I was going to say frozen on my tongue. That was a sentence I never in my life expected to hear. It seemed impossible. Me? 
Blake wanted to go with me? What? I asked, sure that I had heard wrong. I figured you'd rather go to prom with Tommy. He raked his fingers through his hair and sighed. Not that I wanted you to, but I thought that you saw me as not fun enough or adventurous enough or hip enough. I smiled, finally accepting what he was telling me. Well, hip is not a word I would have used to describe you. Book nerd, maybe. Exactly, he said, blowing out a breath. But I wanted to go with you, Hannah. I've always wanted to go with you to anywhere. The prom, the beach, the library, the post office, the... It was my turn to interrupt him and I pulled him closer to me with a hand behind his neck and pressed my lips to his. He kissed me immediately, moving my wine glass to the counter again. I must have bumped it with my hip because there was a sudden clink, but neither of us bothered to stop when the empty glass toppled over. His fingers slipped through my hair at the base of my neck, chills vibrated up and down my neck and his tongue slipped into my mouth and... The stove timer went off with a loud beep beep beep. The pasta, Blake stared at me through hooded eyes a moment and then finally pulled away from me. Hey, if there is any excuse to stop a great kiss, it's pasta, I said, biting my lip. We both laughed a little nervously as he strained the pot. I touched my fingers to my lips while he was at the sink and felt them tingling from his kisses. I was already excited for the next one. He gave me a peck on the cheek before lifting me from the island with his strong hands on my waist and leading me to the table. Bon appétit, he said. I knew you studied French, I said, smiling. We sat down and our toes played together under the table as we ate our pasta and drank our wine and talked with the nervous, excited energy of teenagers. I couldn't stop smiling throughout our dinner conversation. Everything was perfect. Everything was unbelievable. Everything was wonderful and amazing and utterly impossible to believe. As we nibbled on fresh strawberries after dinner, we heard the front door unlock. Blake glanced at his watch. My parents must be home early, he said. As if on cue, Mr. and Mrs. Remington walked into the dining room. I immediately waved hello. I hadn't seen them in quite some time, but they had always been kind to me when I was here with Lucy. This time, all I received were confused frowns. Blake, I thought you said you had a date tonight, Mrs. Remington said, glancing warily at me. Blake reached over and laced his fingers through mine. I am on a date, Mom. With Hannah. Hello, Hannah, Mrs. Remington smiled, but it was oddly cold. Then she threw an icy gaze at Blake. May I speak with you in the other room, please? Mom, I'm with Hannah Wright. Hannah, you don't mind, do you? Mrs. Remington's glare told me there was only one right answer to that question. No, of course not, I said, my voice sounding small even to my own ears. Blake squeezed my hand. I'll be right back. I nodded as he gave me a reassuring smile before following his mother and father out of the formal dining room and into the kitchen. His father closed the French doors, but I could still hear their muffled voices from where I sat frozen at the table. We were under the impression that you meant you wanted to cook dinner here for a date with Cassandra, Blake's mother said, her tone harsh. Why is Hannah here? Cassandra and I are over, he said, confusion clear in his voice. But why, son? Things had been going so well, his father said. No, dad. Things really hadn't been going well. Not for me anyway. Look, whether you or mom or the firm or the country club or anyone else likes it, Cassandra and I are done. We weren't the amazing couple you seemed to think we were. The kitchen was silent for a moment. That is a mistake. Blake, Mrs. Remington finally said. Cassandra is the woman that you need to marry and you know it. She has money, connections, and respect. 
What can Lucy's childhood friend give you that Cassandra can't? My stomach nodded as I waited for Blake to answer, right here in my chair where everything just moments before had been so perfect. I waited and waited until I couldn't wait any longer. On tiptoes, I hurried out the opposite door leading to the foyer. I swept my sneakers up into my arms as I slipped outside and pulled out my cell phone. I felt like Cinderella running away from her prince for the second time. But I had no glass slipper to leave behind at the castle for try number three. Hey, Lucy, I said, into my phone. Can you come get me? Chapter 7 I sighed in relief when the glare of yellow headlights beamed at me from the entrance to the Remington's driveway like two giant cat eyes. It had taken Lucy less time than I'd expected for her to arrive to rescue me. She must have hit every green light in town and then floored it down the freeway to get here so fast. As she pulled up the circular drive behind where Blake's Mercedes was parked, the front door of the mansion opened behind me. Blake paused at the open doorway and then hurried over to me. I quickly wiped away a few tears from my cheeks. I just wanted to go home and put my head under my pillow. Having the job I wanted and the guy I wanted apparently was so not working out the way I'd hoped. Not even close. Hannah, he said, taking long strides. I didn't know where you were. What are you doing out here? I glanced at Lucy in the driver's seat. She wasn't getting out of the car and I didn't get why. I wondered if she was texting someone, but all I could make out was her silhouette with the headlights glaring at me. I took a step toward the car but Blake stepped in front of me. Sorry, I have to go home, I said, thumbing over my shoulder. I, um, I forgot to turn off the oven or something. Blake frowned in confusion. What? Yeah, that's right, I said, words fumbling from my mouth. I was baking before you picked me up for our date. I mean, our casual friendly dinner, business meeting, really, since you've been giving me golf lessons. I should probably pay you for your time. Anyway, the oven, yeah, I forgot to turn it off. So I must go now. Blake sighed. Hannah, please come back inside so we can talk this out. I stepped back from him as I heard Lucy open her car door and mumble something. I'm sorry, Blake, but I really have to go. Lucy is here and… I turned around and immediately crashed into Lucy, except Lucy's hair wasn't that dark or that long. Wait a minute, the woman I ran into wasn't Lucy. I looked up into the narrowed eyes of Cassandra Bishop. Now my nightmare was complete. I belatedly realized Lucy had arrived so quickly because she hadn't. Luck was so not on my side tonight. Watch it! Cassandra shouted as I stumbled back in surprise. You scuffed my Louis Vuittons. I didn't know you were there. I'm so sorry. I watched as Cassandra, who wore an elegant, form-fitting nude cocktail dress I was certain would look entirely out of place on me, leaned down and rubbed at a black mark on her five-inch pumps. Cassandra, what are you doing here? Blake asked, coming up beside me. The front door to the mansion opened again and this time Blake's parents emerged with questioning expressions. I quickly shifted away from Blake so they wouldn't freak out again. Cassandra, sweetheart, so nice to see you, Mrs. Remington said, before exchanging kisses with her. Do come inside. Hannah, you were leaving, yes? Hannah's not going anywhere, Blake interjected before I could explain that Lucy was on her way over to pick me up. What is going on? Cassandra elbowed past me and wrapped her fingers around Blake's arm while smiling up at him. Mrs. Remington asked me to come over. She was worried about you and thought we should talk things over, darling. He frowned down at her, but I couldn't help but notice that he didn't pull his arm from her well-manicured fingers. I also couldn't help but notice how perfect they looked together in their expensive attire that made me feel out of place in my second-hand sundress. 
I glanced over my shoulder, scanning the top of the driveway for Lucy's car. There's nothing to talk about, Cassandra, Blake said. We broke up. We were only on a break. Like Rachel and Ross. But it's been long enough. She shook her head and fluttered her lashes in a dramatic way. I'm sorry, but it's over, he said, but again didn't have her remove her hand. I had the very strong urge to move her hand and tell her to keep it off. But I remained where I was and quiet. I deserved a medal for my restraint. I know things haven't been perfect recently, she said, raising one of her shoulders in a what-can-you-do way. But you can't just throw away all we have. Your parents and I agree it's time we end all this foolishness and get back together. For good. For good? What are you talking about? he asked. My heart stopped as I looked back and forth between the two of them. Cassandra's laugh was carefree as she said like it was the most obvious thing in the world, engaged, silly. That single word stabbed my heart. Engaged? As in getting married forever? And why was he leaving her hand there? A wave of nausea crashed over me and I stepped back. We all know it will be coming soon, won't it, Blake? Mrs. Remington said with a pointed look at her son. Blake sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. Mom, I told you. Just hear her out, Mrs. Remington implored. Let's go inside, Cassandra said, tugging at Blake's arm with her grip. We'll have a glass of wine and talk. No, Blake said, pulling free of Cassandra's grip, finally. Hannah is here and... I held up my hands. Oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. His jaw tightened as he stepped toward me. Hannah. Lucy is on her way to pick me up anyway, I said, taking another step back. Hannah, please. Honk honk honk. A car horn blared and I turned to see Lucy driving in past the lane of manicured shrubs. There she is now, I said, blinking as tears started to pool in the corners of my eyes. Um, nice to see you, Mr. and Mrs. Remington. Your house is lovely, as always. Cassandra, sorry about the shoes. I backpedaled as Lucy parked in front of the house. Blake, thanks for dinner, I said, avoiding eye contact as he walked toward me. Really yummy. Reaching behind me, I fumbled for the passenger door handle of Lucy's car, I double-checked that it was actually her car this time, before tripping and toppling onto the seat. I stretched to pull the door closed when Blake caught it first. He leaned inside and gave me a long look with those coffee brown eyes. Hannah, please don't leave, he said, quietly. I stared back at him. Your parents want you to marry Cassandra, I said, my voice squeaking a bit. It's totally fine. Lucy leaned over. What's going on? Blake, darling, Mrs. Remington called from behind him. Let's just get out of here, Lucy, I said, giving her an imploring look. But why is Cassandra here? Lucy asked. Blake placed a hand on my shoulder. Hannah, you really don't have to go, he whispered. Stay. For me. The oven, remember? I smiled and pulled his hand from my shoulder even though my heart ached to hold it tightly to my chest. I kept his hand in mine as our eyes locked. I knew I had to let him go. I just wanted one moment longer. Goodbye. Blake flinched, his brow wrinkling. Then he stepped back from Lucy's car and I pulled the door shut. I sagged against the seat and noticed Lucy staring at me. The oven? she asked, sounding bewildered. I put my hand over my face. Can we just go home, Lucy? Without another word, she shifted the car into gear and pulled away. 
I closed my eyes to keep myself from looking in the side mirror, because my heart simply couldn't bear to see my dream slipping away yet again. The next morning I needed an excuse to get out of day two, which was the second round of the couple's golf charity tournament weekend. I decided to go with a classic I'm sick excuse and texted Blake, woke up with the flu. Hands are too clammy to hold a golf club. Unless there are toilets at each hole, I'm gonna have to bail. Sorry. I pressed send on my phone and then flopped back into bed with a groan. Then I popped up, closed the window shades to block out the cheerful morning rays, so not okay right now, and then dove under my pillow. In all honesty, I really did feel sick. I'd been up all night tossing and turning. I wanted nothing more than to close my eyes and drift into blissful sleep. A few minutes later, some miracle called my eyelids to start getting heavy. Ding dong! Ding dong! Ding dong! Ugh, the doorbell. I assumed it was a delivery person and wiggled back under the covers. But then the doorbell rang again just moments later five times in a row. Lucy! I called out. Lucy, the door, I said, figuring she'd made some kind of online purchase which she did almost daily. The doorbell continued ringing. So rude. I couldn't possibly get out of bed right now to sign for whatever she needed. Ears perked I waited and when there was nothing but silence I closed my eyes and willed myself not to dream about Blake. Halfway into some kind of dream state wherein I had my new client and my perfect guy, there was a soft knock at my door and I yelped in surprise. Rolling my eyes, I moaned and flopped a hand over my eyes. Lucy, I grumbled. I told you last night I'm not ready to talk about it. The whole ride back to our townhouse she tried to pry the story of what happened out of me, but I'd remained tight-lipped, staring out of the window and counting the passing street lamps. How was I supposed to tell my best friend I'd fallen for her brother only to have him break my heart? Again? When another rap 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 sounded at my door, I folded the pillow over my ear and squeezed my eyes shut. Please go away, I called out. I don't feel like talking. Although I did wonder what she'd bought online and if it could mend a broken heart. Or at least distract it for a while. There was silence for a moment and then I heard my door creak open. I was about to throw a pillow at Lucy's face when I heard a voice much deeper than hers. How do you feel about eating? Blake asked. I flung back the comforter to see Blake standing inside my room, dangling a bag with a takeout container of what appeared to be some kind of soup from the local deli. Um, hi. I said sitting up and smoothing down my bed head as best as I could, cringing as I realized I was wearing my sequined polka dot pajamas. What are you doing here? May I come in? He asked, raising his eyebrows. I guess, but what are you doing here? I repeated, still shocked to see him, especially because he was wearing gray sweatpants and a white t-shirt instead of his golf clothes. Shouldn't you be at the tournament? I glanced at the clock on my wall, noting that the tea time was in 15 minutes. My partner is sick, he said. We're a team, remember? I came over to help you feel better. My eyes bulged. Oh, right. I was supposed to be sick. Cough. Cough. Not a good idea, I said trying to make my voice as raspy as possible. What were flu symptoms again? I don't want to get you sick. Plus, you're late for the tournament. He drummed his knuckles against the side of the door. May I at least come in to show you what I brought? Right at that moment the smell of the soup wafted up my nostrils, making my stomach growl. I couldn't really say no after that, now could I? Not too close, I said, with a sniffle or two. Were sniffles a flu symptom? Sigh. I worked in social media, not in the medical field. And I hadn't been sick in years. Only stay for a minute or else you'll be late for your game. 
Thanks, he said, with a smile that made me feel guilty for faking an illness. But I had to stop my feelings for Blake somehow, finally, after all of these years. It was self-preservation, after all. I mean, just the sight of him as he sat at the edge of my bed made my heart race and then my throat tightened. He scooted closer and placed the paper container of soup on my nightstand and then set a gym bag between us. I held out a hand. Not too close. I could be highly contagious. I'll take my chances. He grinned, unzipping the sports bag and digging around inside. Now, let's see what we have here. This is nice of you, Blake. But you'd seriously better leave now, I said, glancing at the clock. Traffic can get bad, you know. And you'll have to find parking at the country club. Instead of racing to the door, he pulled out cough drops, antacids, ibuprofen, and other various medicines along with a box of tissues, the extra soft kind with aloe vera. So thoughtful. The essentials first, he said, winking at me. Then the fun stuff. He was so sweet and his sweetness was making keeping my heart protected ten times worse. Really, thanks, Blake, I said my stomach clenching. But you'll be holding up all the other pairs if you're late. I appreciate all of this, but you should get going. This is the softest blanket in the entire world, he said, handing over a baby soft blanket. I remember one time you were sick in high school and Lucy draped a blanket around you as you watched Gilmore Girls reruns. My skin hummed as he draped the blanket around my shoulders. Yes, but. And here is a heating pad that's great for any aches and pains, he continued. I tried to balance everything he was handing me in my arms, but it was becoming too much. I wanted to throw my arms around him and tell him that Cassandra would never love him the way that I would. And, I'm sorry, but giving me golf lessons does not count as charity. I should know since I donated plenty of money and time to my friend Abigail Apple's favorite dog rescue rescue at the barn in Harrison's house, the latter being dedicated to puppies, which I thought was so super sweet. Blake, look what time it is, Anne. This tea is an all-around miracle cure. He opened a tin and offered it to me to smell. The lemon and ginger smell wafted up my nose. Yum. I'll make you a cup he said. I shook my head. No, I can't. Your tea time is. Hannah, stop, he said, his voice firm. I turned from looking at the clock and found him staring at me with those coffee brown eyes I loved so much. He'd never used such a serious tone with me in all the years I'd known him. I'm not going to the tournament, he said, before reaching over to squeeze my hand. I'm not leaving you. You're more important than a game of golf. My eyebrows came together. What about Cassandra? What about her? He reached over and lifted my chin with his finger so that I couldn't escape his gaze. Cassandra and I are done. You know that. I blinked. You're not engaged to her? What? No he said, shaking his head. Definitely not. I narrowed my eyes at him. Are you sure? Your mom seemed to have some ideas in that direction. And so did Cassandra. Fortunately, they don't rule my life, he said, letting out a sigh and a huge weight lifted off my chest. Blake was not back together with his ex. He was here, which had to mean he still liked me. After all, he'd remembered my love of soft cozy blankets. Now will you stop asking ridiculous questions and let me nurse you back to health? He asked. I wrinkled my nose, cringing as I peered up at him. Oh, about that, I bit my bottom lip, feeling even more guilty. I'm really sorry, but I'm not exactly sick per se. You're not? He frowned and placed the back of his hand against my forehead. I resisted the urge to lean into his touch. 
His skin was so warm, so soft, and so gentle. Yes, you are. In fact, you're burning up. There's no way you're not sick. Huh? No, I totally made that up because I thought you got back with your ex. Look how flushed you are, though, he said, seeming to assess my face. We definitely need to stay inside all day curled up together watching movies. For your health, of course. He winked at me and that was all it took to lift my lips into a smile. You're totally right about me being sick, I said, finally getting what he meant. And I think we need to eat lots of chocolate and popcorn to help me recover. Exactly. He nodded and pressed his lips to the inside of my wrist, sending goosebumps up my arm. I've heard that chocolate and popcorn are an ancient fake illness remedy. And we can't forget about hot chocolate, I added. He laughed, the sound warming my heart. Every good doctor knows to prescribe mug after mug of the thickest, richest hot chocolate for his patients. I was giggling now, looking forward to a day alone with Blake when his phone rang. I watched as he pulled it from his back pocket and then he frowned at the screen. Who is it? I asked, unsure if I wanted to know the answer. Nobody, he said, smiling up at me before slipping his phone back into his sweatpants pocket. His phone rang again. He pulled it out and pressed a button silencing it. My eyebrows came together as his phone rang for the third time in under a minute. I should have known all of this was too good to be true. I had been dreaming and it was time to wake up. I knew what I had always known, something was always going to pull Blake and me apart. Back in high school it was Tommy and now it was Shailene Woodley's twin. I put a hand on his arm and gave him a look. You should just answer the call, I said, knowing that our do-over was wrecked before we'd even selected the movie. Chapter 8 You better hurry and answer your cell or it's going to ring a fourth time and then a fifth and then, well, you know, I said, giving his shoulder a gentle push. Blake studied me intently for one more ring, before squeezing my knee beneath the covers. All right, but I'll be really quick. They're probably just wondering where I am is all. I nodded as he stood and answered the phone. Hey, Dad, he said, and a feeling of relief washed over me. I'd been sure it was Cassandra. I'm at Hannah's place. I should have let you know sooner, but we're not going to make it today. No, she's sick. I tugged the covers up over my cheeks to hide my blush as guilt poured over me. I'd committed to the tournament and now I was backing out. Yeah, the charity still got its money but maybe Blake had been looking forward to golfing today and I'd ruined his fun by assuming he was back with Cassandra. Check the bag there, he whispered, letting out a long sigh. Pick one out while I finish up. I dragged the tote he'd brought onto my lap and pulled out classic rom-coms Blake used to make fun of Lucy and me for watching. There was How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days, Fifty First Dates, Bridget Jones's Diary, and, I grinned when I saw this one in particular, Serendipity. I placed the movies to the side and looked up to whisper my choice when I noticed Blake's back to me, his hand cupping the receiver. No, I'm sure it's important for the firm, but this is important to me, Blake said, using a hushed voice. Just send my apologies. Yes, I know what's expected of me. Yes, I know I made a commitment. But, people get sick. Yes, I know I'm representing the family. Sometimes life is serendipitous. Sometimes everything falls into place at the right time, with the right person. Sometimes a cancelled prom date leads to a fairy tale romance with a long-time crush. Sometimes a recent breakup and golf lessons is all it takes to result in a lifetime of love after years and years apart. Sometimes it works out. And sometimes it doesn't. Slowly, with one last longing glance at the movie, I slipped the DVD back with the others inside the tote. Dad, I told you. Hannah is sick. 
I don't have a partner, he said, raking his hand through his hair. That kind of defeats the point of a couple's golf tournament. What? Cassandra? She said she'd switch. No, way. Hannah's my partner, I can't just. Blake, I said, hating that I was causing friction between his father and him. He and his dad had always had a good relationship. It would be selfish of me to keep him here after he made a commitment to the tournament. Well, just tell everyone I'm sorry, but I'm not leaving. Blake, I said, raising my voice this time. Blake glanced over at me. Just one glance at me and he froze mid-sentence. Hold on, Dad, he said before covering the receiver and raising an eyebrow. I shifted uncomfortably on the bed and swallowed. You should go to the tournament. Blake took a step toward me. Hannah. No, really. I shook my head and tried to smile as I joked, I don't want you to catch what I've got. It's a pretty nasty bug. He frowned. Hannah, we both know that you're not sick. And you know what they say, I continued, because even though Blake was giving and kind and considerate, I really wanted to do what was best for him. If he stayed here with me, he'd be in trouble with his work and his parents. I couldn't let that happen. I cared about him too much. Sleep is the best thing for a cold, you know? Hannah. Cassandra will be a better golf partner anyway, I said, forcing a smile. She was the person his parents wanted him to be with, so he should golf with her. She'd also knew how to schmooze with everyone, which was what he needed to succeed with work. We both know she's a better partner for you, Blake. You mean as a golf partner only, right? He asked, an expression of hurt flickering across his handsome face. This expression deepened when I didn't answer. Coming to the edge of my bed, he stared down at me. He seemed ready to wrap his arms around me, to watch serendipity and to eat popcorn with chocolate and be mine. I knew because it was exactly how I felt at the base of the stairs that night in my prom dress. But just like me when I'd had the chance to express how I truly felt, he didn't say any of that. And I felt exhausted. I honestly need some sleep, Blake, I said, knowing I shouldn't be selfish. I didn't want Blake to be at odds with his parents because of me. He'd be miserable without the support of his mom and dad. His family was so tight. I needed to let him go, even if that meant breaking my heart. Would you please close the door behind you when you leave? He opened his mouth to say something, but I would never know what he'd planned to say because a loud voice from his cell phone interrupted the tense silence between us. He raised the phone back up and sighed. Fine, Dad, he said, glancing once more over at me. I'll be right there. I swallowed the lump that had formed in my throat. Tears stunned the backs of my eyes as Blake walked toward my bedroom door. When he reached the hall, he turned back to me. I hope you feel better soon, Hannah, he said. With that he closed the door behind him. And I let the tears fall. A few minutes after Blake left for the golf tournament, there was a faint knock at my bedroom door that I barely heard her from underneath the mountain of blankets I'd piled on my head. Go away, Lucy. I called from my cave of misery and woe. I don't want to talk. Hannah, Lucy said, her voice gentle from outside my room. Hannah, I've got mimosas and pancakes. You know you can't resist them. My stomach growled in response. I groaned and pulled the comforter tighter over my head. I don't want pancakes. Yes, you do, she cooed enticingly. I put extra butter on them, too, just how you like it. Why don't you come help me eat them? My stomach grumbled again under the sheets, but I knew it was a trap. She wanted me to talk. This was all Lucy's fault. I never would have fallen in love with Blake if she hadn't agreed to live in the townhome right next door to him. 
How was I supposed to resist all of those walks to Courtney's coffee cart with him? I'm not hungry, I lied. She sighed and I heard her footsteps disappearing down the stairs. A little while later, Lucy returned to my room and this time there was nothing soft or gentle or quiet about her arrival. My door swung open without warning and I pulled up the covers in surprise to find Lucy marching straight toward me. Lucy, what in the world? I'm sorry, Hannah, she said, as she stormed to my bedside. But I've tried this the easy way, I really did. I even made pancakes and you know I'm a terrible cook. The stove top is not my friend and, okay, they may have been a little burnt. But that is how much I love you. As your best friend, it's my responsibility to make you feel better, even if that means by force. By force? I asked, not liking the sound of that at all. I thrust the comforter over my head. A moment later, the comforter was ripped from over me. I stared at Lucy in puffy-eyed bewilderment. This is for your own good, she said, before wrapping her arms around me and squeezing until I could barely breathe. Now tell me what's wrong, sweetie. I squirmed against her vice-like grip with little luck. Her personal trainer at the totally fit gym was certainly earning his salary, for sure. I can't tell you, I finally said. Why not? Lucy released me enough to look into my eyes. You know you can tell me anything. Anything. I shook my head stubbornly. Not this. She frowned in confusion. What, did you murder someone? She asked, seeming to ponder the idea. I mean, I guess I can help as long as I don't get blood on my Gucci SH. Of course I didn't murder someone, Lucy. Then what? She asked. I can't tell you. Why? Because it's about your brother. I shouted at long last and then sank into Lucy's hug, which felt really good. Then I told her about her parents and Cassandra and the pretty little picture that I didn't fit into. I told her about Blake coming over. I told her about Blake leaving. I told her about my broken heart. And now I'm miserable. I hadn't thought it was possible to keep producing tears, I'd cried so much already. But my tear ducts seemed determined to prove me wrong. Hannah, she said, after a long silence passed. Can I tell you a secret? Yes. I glanced over at her and nodded. She lay down beside me and propped herself up onto her elbow. Back in high school, I told you I called Blake to take you to prom as a favor to me. I sat up and nodded. Yeah, so? Well, Lucy smiled sheepishly. That's not exactly the truth. I raised an eyebrow. Blake was the one who suggested he take you to prom. My heart did a double flip. Blake suggested it? Lucy nodded. He asked me not to tell you it was his idea. Why would he do that? Isn't it obvious now? She asked, putting a hand on my shoulder. Because he obviously liked you. I didn't get that at the time, but hello? Why else would he offer to take you? And you know my brother will do anything to please our parents, such a suck up. She shook her head and rolled her eyes. So the fact that he's going against what they want and following his own heart to date you should tell you how much you mean to him. I sniffled, unable to believe it had been Blake's idea to take me to prom. He must have been so hurt if he thought I wanted to go with Tommy instead just because he showed up. Kind of similar to how I thought he might prefer to be with Cassandra since his parents wanted him to be with her. Thank you for telling me. Lucy handed me a box of tissues from my nightstand. I still don't get what you see in my geeky brother. But I love you both so much. How cool would it be if things worked out between you two? You need to give him a real chance if you want that to happen. Something inside me shifted. 
You're right, Lucy. I've been holding back with him, dressing in your clothes at the golf course just so I'd fit into that part of his world. Maybe you've been holding back from being yourself at work, too, she said, gently. The realization hit me. You're right. I have been holding back. Part of me had always felt weird or different because I had such a different background from you and Blake. I've been so busy wearing pearls and trying to be like everyone else that I've forgotten who I am. Your poofy prom dress with hot pink sneakers, Hannah. Maybe the blue eye shadow can go now. Definitely time for the blue to go. I laughed, feeling better than I had in months. You're a good friend, Lucy. What would I do without you here to tell me when I'm acting foolish? I'll always be there for the kind, thoughtful person who shared her apple slices with the scared little girl who had dropped her tray of food on the floor of the cafeteria, certain she had ruined kindergarten. You thought you'd ruined your year? You always look so confident. None of us are confident all of the time, Hannah. I had a hard time confronting my boss to tell him how disappointed I was that he chose the old branding concept for the tournament. It took all the courage I had to also let him know that I thought it was a disservice going with the old concept and that using the new concept on the main archway to the club would be a subtle but important step into a fresh and modern brand concept for the event. I nodded, clasping my hands together. I saw your designs around the main archway to the club yesterday. It looked fantastic. Thanks, she said, lifting her chin a little as she smiled. It wasn't like me to hold my thoughts back like that but I figured if my boss didn't at least listen to my opinion respectfully then that meant I should work for someone who appreciates my feedback. You're right, I said, finally getting what I'd forgotten for a while. The best we can hope for is to be ourselves and find people who love us just the way we are. She smiled at me and I smiled back, warmth flowing through my chest. I love you for exactly who you are, Hannah. Your old boss Jennifer obviously thought you were talented just the way you are, too, since she fought for you to have that promotion. You're right. She did believe in me, the real me, free-spirited style and all. I guess I was so worried about losing what I'd always wanted that I forgot that it's not worth it if I can't be myself. Feeling any better? She asked. Tons better. I beamed a smile at my best friend and then said slowly, Did you say something about pancakes and mimosas? I'm in all the way. Chapter 9 That evening, in my softest pajamas and fluffiest socks, I curled up on the couch with my laptop on my knees, a tub of popcorn to my left, and the biggest bag of chips I could find at the grocery store on my right. My love life might be a mess, and judging by the amount of crumbs on my top, maybe my health as well, but I was determined to at least fix my relationship with my client, Mr. Livingston, after the debacle on the golf course. I had Katy Perry's firework blasting from the living room stereo for inspiration as I brainstormed how to prove my professionalism to my client, hey, anyone can lose it over a ball in the sand trap, so I could pitch that my company was worth his investment. I stared at the blinking cursor on the blank white document on my laptop screen and groaned as my head flopped back against the back of the couch. Nothing. Zero ideas. I was doomed. I was about to start searching for a new job and updating my resume when the ring of the doorbell interrupted me. Leaning back with half a chip between my teeth, I shouted toward the kitchen, Lucy. Door. Returning to scroll through an online job board, I stuffed another chip into my mouth just as the doorbell rang again. I groaned. Had I seen her holding a yoga mat earlier? Maybe she'd gone to the gym without telling me. Lucy! I called out, waiting for a reply from my best friend. Lucy? When there was only silence followed by yet another insistent ring of the doorbell, I moved my laptop to the coffee table, brushed the crumbs from my pajama top, and trudged toward the door. There was no one I wanted to see right now and there was especially no one who I wanted to see me in my present condition of work obsession. I'm coming, I'm coming, I grumbled as the doorbell rang again. With a sigh, 
I opened the door and then gaped at Blake in horror. He raised an eyebrow. Nice to see you, too. I took a second to catch my breath, smoothed down my ruffled pajama day hair, and dusted my lips free of chip powder before slowly opening the door all the way. Blake. Hannah. Okay, we'd gotten our names out of the way. I was going to ask what he was doing here. He should be at the gala to celebrate the end of the couple's charity golf tournament. He shouldn't be here on my doorstep. But the question that fell from my lips was not the question I intended to ask. Instead, I asked in complete and utter bewilderment, What are you wearing? He looked down at his outfit and straightened the lapels of the black tuxedo jacket over the white collared shirt and black vest. The seams of the jacket pulled around his shoulders big time and the pants were a smidge tight around his thighs from his considerably more muscular physique compared to his teenage years, but it was the very same tuxedo from prom night. I totally recognized it. The question of the day was, why was he wearing it? You don't like my tuxedo? he asked holding out his arms and doing a little spin for me on my front step. I shook my head in disbelief. Did you invent a time machine or something? Because you'll have to go back about eight years to when that tux would fit you right. He wore an infectious grin as he stepped inside the townhouse and took my hands in his. If I'd invented a time machine, Hannah, there's only one moment I would want to go back to. Which moment? I asked, my voice no louder than the faintest of whispers as something percolated in the back of my brain. Remind me of the theme of your senior prom again? He asked, the question baffling me. Paris or Parisian nights, or something like that, I think, I said, remembering lots of Eiffel Towers, berets and crepes, lots and lots of crepes. My eyebrows knitted together. Shouldn't you be at the gala for the couple's charity golf tournament with Cassandra? He took my hands in his. Do you still have that dress you tried on a couple weeks ago? I raised a curious eyebrow. My prom dress? He nodded. The silver and black one with the poofy black skirt. That's called tulle, I said, thinking of my prom dress. He had asked about my prom theme and now he was asking about my dress. And he was standing here at the bottom of the staircase in my townhouse in a tuxedo. I suddenly couldn't swallow properly and feared he would notice how sweaty my palms were getting. Do you have that dress? He repeated. I nodded, unable to speak anymore. And that sparkly eye shadow? Maybe. And those hot pink sneakers? I gasped. Was he getting at what I thought he was getting at? He smiled down at me. It seems I only have one more question left for you then. My breath caught in my throat. Was this actually happening? I wondered if Blake could hear my heart thudding in my chest, because the sound was practically deafening. He squeezed my hands and said exactly what I'd wanted to hear all those years ago, what I had heard only in my wildest of dreams. Hannah, will you go to prom with me? I would love to be your date if you'll have me. It wasn't the Moulin Rouge, but with Blake's hand in mine it was close. A narrow stretch of manicured green grass wound beneath the stars twinkling high above to a windmill strung with tiny lights. It circled lazily around and around amongst the laughter of children, the bubbling of a quaint stream, just a little bit smaller than the Seine, and the faint melody of French classics, like Edith Piaf and Charles Osnavour playing from tall speakers. The wind tousled the tulle skirt of my prom dress as I looked out across the Parisian-themed miniature golf course complete with concrete paths painted to look like cobblestone streets that twisted between the iconic Eiffel Tower, the glass pyramid of the Louvre, and a massive, plastic croissant, because, why not? What do you think of your Chateau de Golf miniature golf course prom? he asked. I looked up at him and grinned. I think it was well worth the wait. You can definitely say we waited a long time for this. He laughed and bent down to place my golf ball on the rubber pad in front of the first hole with the windmill. Let's see what you've got, Hannah, he said with a wink that made me weak in the knees. 
I set my feet hip distance apart and add the small opening through the windmill, concentrating to get the timing just right. Too soon or too late and the ball would bounce back to my pink sneakers. Timing was everything. But as I pulled back my neon pink putter, Blake interrupted me, saying, wait, wait. I looked up from the golf ball in confusion. But that confusion only grew when Blake snapped his fingers and ran off toward the parking lot, leaving me alone at the hole. Just hold on, he called over his shoulder as he leaped between the steeples of Notre Dame. I'll be right back. Glancing around at the families with kids who were golfing, I rocked back and forth on my heels. What in the world was he doing? A minute later, Blake jogged back to me with something in his hand. He opened the clear plastic cover of a corsage. I forgot to give you this. It's so pretty. I reached out to gently brush my finger along the petals, soft like velvet. May I? he asked. I nodded, because I couldn't quite form words at the moment. Goosebumps traveled up my arms as Blake slipped the corsage around my wrist. I couldn't help but smile when his tongue darted out of the corner of his mouth in his intense focus. There, he finally said, stepping back and admiring his work. He looked me up and down from head to toe before smiling at me. Happy prom, Hannah Griffin. I laughed. Happy prom, Blake Remington. We returned to the windmill and with my dress on and with my corsage in place and with my prom date finally by my side I got the timing right, perfectly right. There was no arch of pink and gold balloons like the one in the entrance to the high school cafeteria, but we walked arm in arm with our golf putters, beneath a replica of the Arc de Triomphe and Blake kissed my cheek in the shadow. Confetti didn't cover the fake cobblestones we meandered along as we laughed and chatted, but the stars above sparkled brighter than any silver confetti ever could. I wouldn't have traded Blake's French accent as he sang along to the Champel Assise, totally uncaring of the teenagers staring at him over by the crepe stand piled high with tubs of Nutella and bananas. As we went through the miniature golf course, I forgot about the scorecard, about par, even about getting the silly little colorful balls in the holes. We were too wrapped up in each other. The end of the course came all too soon and I hesitated at the start of the final hole. It was a tricky one where you had to hit the ball perfectly so it traveled up a ramp to the top of a bright red beret. The ball would disappear into the hole and that would be it. Prom would be over. On my first swing, I purposefully tried to miss and hit the ball so it would bounce back and forth on the walls and end up behind the ramp to the top of the beret. It would have been the hardest place to recover from. It would have taken me many strokes to get the ball in the hole. But in a true testament of my terrible golf skills, I nailed the shot and watched in horror as my ball climbed straight up to the top of the red beret and disappeared into the hole. No! I shouted. Blake laughed at my despair and pointed toward the beret. What do you mean? You nailed it, honey. I blushed and stared at my pink shoes. I wanted to miss. He glanced at the hole that my ball disappeared into, never to be returned to me to stall this wonderful evening any longer. But why would you do that, he asked, pulling me against him and enveloping me into a hug that made me feel warm and cozy and happy. Because I don't want prom to be over, I admitted, looking up into Blake's eyes. I want prom night to keep going. I'm not ready for it to end. Maybe it doesn't have to end, he said, clearly up to something. What do you mean? I know a place where we can go dancing tonight, he said, his grin growing. I narrowed my eyes in suspicion. Where? The tournament gala at the club. The golf tournament gala is going on right now? With all of the people who attended the golf tournament? Like everyone? I asked, an idea percolating in my mind. Yes, even my parents will be there. I understand if you don't want to. Let's go! I cheered, knowing the opportunity in front of me. 
I took Blake's hand and led him down the cobblestone walkway, passing the giant croissant and passing the Eiffel Tower. You're in quite the hurry to dance, he said. Oh, we will dance, I said, thinking that dancing on my prom night with the date I'd really wanted was long overdue. But there's something important I have to do first. Chapter 10 Even though I was in love with my prom date and this had pretty much been the best night of my life, I had to admit that he'd lost his marbles. No way, Blake. I shook my head and waved my hands frantically from the passenger seat of his Mercedes, but he still pulled into the drive of the Arbor Grove Country Club. Hello? Blake? You asked and I said no. This is the point where you turn the car around. This is not going to happen while I'm dressed like this. comprenez vous Hannah. There is no way. Like zero chance. Nope, absolutely not. No, no, no. I only stopped speaking because I was about to run out of air. And even as I gasped a deep breath into my lungs, I continued to shake my head and wave my hands at Blake. Stop worrying so much about what you're wearing, he said, in an absolutely calm voice. How could he be so chill when I was freaking out in the seat next to him? He really was the yin to my yang. Or was I the yin and he was the yang? Oh, why was this something I was worried about right now? I clearly had enough problems. I can't go in their dress like this, I said, pointing toward the big glass lobby flashing with colored lights and pounding with music. Like I said, I need to run home and change first. I gestured at my black tulle skirt. The client I need to land, Mr. Livingston, is in there. His first impression of me hacking away at a ball in the sand trap was not exactly ideal. How professional will he think I am if I walk in wearing this? You look beautiful, he said, looking at me with those coffee brown eyes. Then he stopped my momentary freak out with his lips by giving me a sweet and gentle kiss. Frozen from his touch, I stared into his eyes as he pulled away, cupped my cheeks, and smiled. Besides, do you see what I'm wearing? he asked. I glanced again at his tuxedo. Yeah, you're a little overdressed in a too small for you tuxedo. How embarrassing, I said, using a deadpan tone. At one point in my life, it would have embarrassed me. He paused, making sure sure my eyes were on him as he continued. But I've changed because of you, Hannah. You showed me the joy of being yourself. I did? I asked, thinking if he only knew the identity crisis I'd gone through the last couple months he'd be shocked. Yes, you showed me that the clothes you're wearing aren't as important as the heart beneath them. You showed me that I don't need a nice car, a country club membership, or a tuxedo that fits to be enough for you, he said, running his thumb along my cheekbone. Of course you're enough, I said, melting under his touch. I've crushed on you my whole life, Blake. All that time I thought we were doomed, but now I realize that we are meant to be. Took you long enough to figure that out, Griffin, he joked, letting out a laugh. Then his face sobered. Now, let's go in there, in front of everyone, and celebrate that we're finally together. I want to celebrate that with you, Hannah. I want to spend tonight and all of my life celebrating that with you. Right back at ya, I said, a warm feeling falling through me since I felt the same way about him. I sucked in a deep, shaky breath. All right, Blake. Let's go show these people that promware is making a comeback. That's the Hannah Griffin the first know and love, he said with a smile. Did you say? My mouth dropped open and tingles skittered up and down my spine as I searched his coffee brown eyes. The corner of his mouth lifted as he nodded, holding out his arm for me to take. I couldn't stop the grin from spreading across my face as I slipped my hand under his arm. You know what? Blake Remington? I love you, too. Together, we strode arm in arm into the gala.
Crystal chandeliers twinkled and a DJ played the latest hit song as we stepped into the crowd surrounding the dance floor. We drew look after look as we practically parted the sea of people. But our grand entrance was cut short when I spotted my potential client, no, my future client, think positive, Mr. Livingston. He also saw me and, um, seemed to recognize me. Blush. Panic flooded through my chest as I strode toward him, holding my hand out in greeting. Mr. Livingston. I'm Hannah Griffin from Haskell and Haskell. So nice to see you here. Pleased to meet you, Ms. Griffin, he said, shaking my hand. His peppered hair was a little long and curly to boot. I would have expected to find him wearing a simple, black suit that looked the exact same as everyone else's there, except for Blake's, of course, but I was surprised to find him in a green velvet tuxedo with a floral printed shirt underneath. A bright pink orchid was pinned to his lapel. Hello, Blake. Nice to see you again, sir. I smiled politely as they shook hands and exchanged pleasantries. It figured Blake knew him and that his dad's firm represented him. It hit me that if I'd know that then I could have just asked Blake for an introduction and avoided the golfing debacle. But, then again, I wouldn't have spent all of that time with Blake and realized we wouldn't be where we were now. I've been wanting to speak to you, Ms. Griffin, Mr. Livingston said, not seeming to notice or care about my poofy dress of choice. I was looking for you, but I didn't see you on the golf course today. Oh, well, my cheeks heated and I hoped the bright pink would be concealed by the dance floor lights. Hannah wasn't feeling well this morning, Blake said, giving my hand an encouraging squeeze. But she's much better now. Clearly, Mr. Livingston said, wearing an amused grin as he noticed my hot pink tennis shoes. I've received several messages from my assistant that you left regarding my brand's social media. Yes, sir, I said, a million thoughts going through my mind as I cringed. Please let me make a proper appointment so I can pitch my ideas to you in your office. Don't decide right now. I know I embarrassed myself out on the golf course, but you have to understand. Enough. Mr. Livingston shook his head and held his hand up in an unequivocal gesture for me to stop. Ms. Griffin, I've made my decision. I took a step forward. You have? But if you can just come to my office on Monday then I can prove myself first, I said, knowing he was about to tell me there was no way he could possibly work with me at Haskell and Haskell after the mess I'd made in the sand pit. Ms. Griffin, Mr. Livingston said, firmly. My decision is final. The music pulsed around me, my heart pounded against my rib cage, and for the first time in my life I said nothing. Just waited. I'm hiring you, he said. I'd heard him speak, but had I heard him correctly? I told myself it was impossible. He couldn't have said what I thought he just said. I'd hacked at that ball about a hundred times with no success. Blake leaned toward my ear and whispered, this is the part where you accept the position. I glanced at Blake and then stared at Mr. Livingston, who gave me a half-smile. You want me to manage your social media? I asked, needing confirmation one more time. Even after I freaked out on the golf course and showed up here in a prom dress? It's because of those things that I want to work with you, he said, looking me straight in the eye. I've already looked at your bio on the Haskell and Haskell website. But what convinced me was your dress. I want to work with someone with passion who takes risks and embraces themselves fully and that is precisely you. Even after the sand trap? I blurt. Everyone fails, Ms. Griffin. The sign of a person deemed for success is a person who doesn't give up. He extended his hand toward me. Do you accept? Absolutely. I glanced up at Blake whose eyes were shining with happiness and pride for me. Lifting my chin and pulling back my shoulders, I shook Mr. Livingston's hand with confidence in my work, confidence in my abilities, confidence in myself, just the way I was. 
The moment Mr. Livingston disappeared into the gyrating crowd, I turned to Blake wearing the biggest grin and then I shrieked in pure joy. In fact, my cheeks started to hurt from smiling so hard. I'd gotten the job. Yay, me. Can you actually believe what just happened, Blake? I asked. Yes, I can actually, he said, pulling me into a tight hug. I thought nothing in this perfect moment with Blake could ruin my happiness, but then I heard a familiar voice that sounded like nails on a chalkboard. Blake, darling, what is that absolutely hideous thing you're wearing? I pulled away from Blake's arms to find Cassandra snaking toward us wearing a scowl. Oh, great. Probably the last person in the world I wanted to see. She looked amazing in a black dress that was probably a Christian Dior. Her ears and neckline dripped with diamonds. Don't you know who is here? Cassandra said, grabbing hold of Blake's arm and attempting to drag him away. Hannah and I are here, he said, slipping his arm around my waist. That's all I care about, really. Cassandra crossed her arms. What are you wearing? I demand an explanation for this utter ridiculousness. Blake feigned confusion as he stared down at his old, too small tuxedo. You don't like my tux? he asked. Not at all. I mean really, Blake. She shook her head in disgust and gave me only a cursory glance before turning back to him. It's nearly busting at the seams and the pants are two inches too short. Well, I like it, he said, which made my heart leap. I watched as Cassandra sighed in frustration, rubbed at her temples, and exhaled loudly. She finally opened her eyes and pointed a finger at Blake. Listen to me, Blake, in less than ten minutes we're supposed to be taking pictures with your father's law firm partners and the mayor and the other highest donors for the couple's charity golf tournament. She jabbed her finger at Blake's chest. You have until then to change into something more respectable, more like you. Cassandra, this is me. It's not, Blake, she insisted. You're from a good family with a good name in a good, high-standing part of society. Just imagine what your parents would think if they saw you like this. This is beneath you, she said, giving me a glance to make it obvious she thought I was beneath him, too. That was it. I'd had enough. Are you referring to me? I asked, watching her raise her eyebrows at me in response. Look, this dress might be cheap, old and smell of mothballs. It might also be horribly out of fashion according to designer magazines. But it makes me happy, so deal with it. She narrowed her eyes at me and then down at my shoes. I took a step closer. I may have hot pink sneakers on, but I love this outfit. You know, Criticizing me doesn't make you look any better. It just makes you look mean. She gaped at me. How dare you? I dare because it's long overdue. Hope you have a nice night, I said, pushing past her and weaving my way through the crowd, unable to stop the grin tugging at my cheeks. Let her go, Blake, I heard Cassandra say behind me. She's not worth it. We have pictures to take, darling. I was halfway to the front door of the country club to leave the gala when I winced with everyone else at the screech of interference from the DJ's microphone. Sorry, sorry, came a familiar voice, echoing above the crowd. Sorry, everyone. I'm, um, not used to using this thing. I stopped and I turned, sucking in a surprised breath when I saw Blake holding a microphone in the DJ booth, blinking and shifting from foot to foot in the spotlight. What was he doing? Good evening, everyone. I watched as the entire crowd's attention focused on him, standing up there in his two sizes too small tuxedo from a decade ago. Even I could see the inch or two of his ankle poking out from the two short pant legs. So surely his fellow lawyers, his family, his potential clients, and every high-class Sacramento citizen could see it, too. 
Moving through the crowd was one thing, but jumping up on stage and commanding the spotlight was an entirely different matter altogether. I took a step closer as I frowned in confusion. What in the world was he doing? Why wasn't he following me back to the car? We could be hitting more golf balls at Chateau de Golf in 20 minutes if we left now. So, all right then, Blake muttered, clearly uncomfortable with all of the attention on him. He had always been more comfortable in a quiet corner with a book. I won't take up too much of your time, but there's something I need to say. He again cleared his throat as the crowd stirred. People glanced at the people next them for answers as whispers spread through the crowd. There is a woman that I love and every time I've had the chance to fight for her, I've blown it, he explained, his voice becoming sturdier, his stance more uncomfortable. And every time she's left, I've had the chance to run after her, to call after her, or do something to stop her and every time I've just watched her go. He squinted against the glare of the bright lights fixed on him on the stage and my heart rate jumped when I saw him looking for me. I knew I would be nearly impossible to see back here at the very edge of the large crowd. Hannah, wherever you are, he continued, my name sending goosebumps up and down my arms. I'm done leaving. We're staying right here and finally having that dance that is long overdue. So, Hannah Griffin, if you can hear me, may I have this dance? I held my breath as Blake nodded toward the DJ, set down the microphone that again let out a horrible screech, and jumped down to the dance floor where the crowd parted into a wide semicircle. I supposed that everyone in their fancy suits of finely woven wool and elegant silk dresses weren't super thrilled to be so close to so much polyester as I started forward. Shania Twain's You're Still the One began to play over the speakers. Through wavering vision I watched between the shoulders of the crowd as Blake scratched at the back of his neck and then to my utter shock and surprise, began dancing. Blake's dance moves weren't going to win any awards, but he shook his hips and swayed his shoulders and moved his feet side to side. He was showing everyone once and for all who he truly wanted to be with, me. I spotted his mom and dad standing nearby and he waved at them, wearing a hopeful look. His mom put her hand over her heart, turned to her husband and I could tell she knew her dream of Blake and Cassandra was over. I liked the Remingtons and hoped they'd get used to Blake and me together. If not, then we would deal with it. He was waiting for me. It wasn't at the base of the steps of his parents' house on prom night, but he was still there, waiting for me after all this time. Brushing a tear from my cheek, I continued pushing my way through the crowd. People turned to give me funny looks, but I ignored them, because I wanted to get to him. It was all I wanted. He was all I ever wanted. The last row of people on the edge of the semicircle stepped aside and I would always remember the very moment his eyes found me. In those brown eyes, I saw joy. I saw elation. I saw my future. With a beaming smile, he walked up to me as Shania belted out, ain't nothing better, we beat the odds together, I'm glad we didn't listen. I shivered as he held out his hand to me, strong, steady, and certain. When I put my hand in his, he pulled me close to him and placed his other around me. As we danced our prom dance, not caring at all that anyone was watching, he grinned down at me. You'll always be the one, Hannah, he said. I gasped as he pulled me tight, leaned down, and pressed his lips to mine. It was the most wonderful surprise. My eyes fluttered closed in his strong arms as I melted into the warmth of his kiss. I lost myself in our swaying bodies as the song ended and another began. Still, we continued dancing and at some point everyone else had joined in. It had taken him moving next door for us to get here, but maybe that was only because we had to find ourselves first. I was now happy with myself and he was now comfortable in his own skin, so we finally fit perfectly together. The End If you enjoyed spending time with these characters, be sure to read Lucy's story in Date to the Rescue, Do Over Date series, Book 4. You have been listening to the Date Next Door, Do Over Date series, 
Book 3, by Susan Hatler, Copyright 2020 by Susan Hatler, Audiobook Copyright 2023 by Susan Hatler. Susan Hatler is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author who writes humorous and emotional women's fiction and young adult novels. Many of Susan's books have been translated into German, Spanish, French, and Italian. A natural optimist, she believes life is amazing, people are fascinating, and imagination is endless. She loves spending time with her characters and hopes you do, too.